ਐਸੀ ਬੇਬਸੀ ਹੈ ਬਣਦੀਆਂ ਭੁੱਖਾਂ ਹੀ ਕੀ ਖਬਰਾਂ ਮਿਲੇ ਕਿਉਂ ਜੂਨ ਹੋਕੇ ਦੀ ਨੀ ਹਾਸੇ ਵਰਗਿਓ ਕੁੜੀਓ ਨੀ ਫੁੱਲਾਂ ਵਰਗਿਓ ਕੁੜੀਓ ਨੀ ਛਾਵਾਂ ਕਰ ਦਿਓ ਕੁੜੀਓ ਹਨਰੇਬਲ ਗੈਸਟਸ ਆਫ ਦ ਡੇ ਐਮਿਨੈਂਟ ਸਪੀਕਰਸ ਪ੍ਰੋਫੈਸਰ ਕਰਨਜੀਤ ਸਿੰਘ ਜੀ ਵਰਦੀ ਵਾਈਸ ਚਾਂਸਲਰ ਜਗਤ ਗੁਰੂ ਨਾਨਕ ਦੇਵ ਪੰਜਾਬ ਸਟੇਟ ਓਪਨ ਯੂਨੀਵਰਸਿਟੀ ਪਟਿਆਲਾ ਡਿਸਟਿੰਗਿਸ਼ਡ ਡਿਗਨੀਟਰੀਜ਼ ਆਫ ਦ ਯੂਨੀਵਰਸਿਟੀ ਮੈਂਬਰਸ ਆਫ ਦ ਫੈਕਲਟੀ ਸਟਾਫ ਐਂਡ ਦ ਆਗਸਟ ਆਡੀਅנס ਅ ਵੈਰੀ ਬਿਊਟੀਫੁਲ ਮਾਰਨਿੰਗ ਟੂ ਆਲ ਆਫ ਯੂ ਆਈ ਗੁਰਲੀਨ ਆਲੀਵਾਲੀਆ ਔਨ ਬਿਹਾਫ ਆਫ ਦ ਸਕੂਲ ਆਫ ਸੋਸ਼ਲ ਸਾਇੰਸਸ ਐਂਡ ਦ ਸਕੂਲ ਆਫ ਲੈਂਗੁਏਜਸ ਵੈਲਕਮ ਯੂ ਦੋ ਦ ਵੈਦਰ ਇਜ਼ ਕੋਲਡ ਬਟ ਵਿਦ ਡੀਪ ਵਾਰਮਥ ਇਨ ਆਵਰ ਹਾਰਟਸ ਟੂ ਦ ਨੈਸ਼ਨਲ ਵੈਬਿਨਾਰ ਔਨ ਗਰਲ ਚਾਈਲਡ ਇਨ ਇੰਡੀਆ ਇਸ਼ੂਜ਼ ਐਂਡ ਕਨਸਰਨਸ ਸਿੰਸ 2008 with the initiative of the ministry of women and child development national girl child day has been celebrated across the country on on sorry january 24 every year to address the challenges that girls face in indian society to highlight the gender inequalities to bring gender sensitization and to generate awareness on the rights of a girl child the importance of girl education health and nutrition like every year this year the theme of national girl child day 202022 is empowering girls for a brighter tomorrow but the moot question here is has the call for equality gained decibels only in the academic circles and public discussions or you think we have succeeded in breaking the stereotype could we manage to bring the paradigm shift in the mindset of people or the issue is just reduced to political rhetoric have the rights and dignity of girls been protected or you feel that the seldom raised voice voices of these girls are still muzzled so to tell deliberate on all these issues and to throw light on other important aspects associated with the day we have amongst us the very honorable professor mary e joan former director women development studies new delhi professor neera verma former dean and chairperson department of economics kurukshetra university and dr madanjeet kaur sahota ji member juvenile justice board chandigarh but before we proceed further following the tradition of invoking the blessings of the almighty god even before taking a single small step in the university i'd like to request all of you to pay obeisance to the university anthem with folded hands stand up please to the university anthem jagat guru nanak de noor ch roshan hai vishnu de tela संगत पंगत वंद छपण दी सहज विवेक अते सृजन दी करता पुरख रहस दर्शन दी सिखिया देवन वाला ਸਰਨੀ ਸਰਨੀ 
I request every all the participants to kindly mute themselves. Thank you. Uh, the government of Punjab, with the aim to illuminate the lamps of education and awareness in every home across the state, has established Jagat Guru Nanak Dev Punjab State Open University in Patiala during the 550th birth anniversary celebrations of Shri Guru Nanak Dev Ji under the Act 19 of 2019. And we, the entire crew of the university, under the stewardship of our worthy Vice Chancellor, sir, are committed to the cause and will leave no stone unturned in the expansion of skill-based education in the state. I'm pleased to share with all of you that the very first session of the certificate courses and the undergraduate programs in the streams of sciences and emerging technologies, commerce and business management and liberal arts has already been rolled out. Following the motto of SEVA enshrined in its act, the university aims at providing skill enhancement programs to increase employability opportunities with added wisdom made viable through accessibility of knowledge at the doorstep of the learners. I would like to specially mention here that besides providing free education to 550 economically disadvantaged and impoverished students of the state, the university, in a bid to honor the philosophy and ideas of Shri Guru Nanak Dev Ji, gives additional benefits to the girl students of the university. Before I hand over stage to our great motivation, our team leader, uh, Professor Anita Gilji, who's been our inspiration for all the activities, especially academic ones that are conducted in the university, I could not resist myself from sharing the beautiful lines of Amrita Pritamji's poem, which she wrote almost half a century ago, evoking the spirit of Varith Shah for the plight of people during partition, especially women during partition. And I feel to some extent, those beautiful lines perhaps still stand true. Aj akha varas shah no kite kabra vichyo bol. Aj katabe ishkada koi agla varka fool. Ik roi si ti Punjab di. To lick lick mare van, ad lakhatiya rundia, then varas shan again. Now I request Madam Anita Gilji to extend formal welcome to the guests with her kind words. Ma'am, please. Kash har subha navratri ki ashtami si hoti. Taki. हमें हर बेटी बालिका मां दुर्गा देवी सी लगती गुड मॉर्निंग ऑन वर्दी वाइस चांसलर प्रोफेसर करमजीत सिंह आर एस्टीम स्पीकर्स ऑफ द डे प्रोफेसर मेरी जॉन प्रोफेसर नीरा वर्मा डॉक्टर मदनजीत सहोता डॉक्टर धर्म सिंह संधू प्रोफेसर जीएस बत्रा एंड ऑल माय कोलीग्स फ्रॉम द यूनिवर्सिटी from my previous university, scholars, teachers, friends, guests, everyone who are here with us today, I extend you all a very warm welcome 
to this webinar on girl child organized by our university on national girl child day girl child day is celebrated not only in india but internationally as we on different days however i prefer to rephrase the term celebration with a wake up call girl child day is a sort of wake up call to all of us to sensitize ourselves to the issues that girls all over the world are facing right from birth or should i say before birth also till the last breath of their life many of us rather all of us sitting over here may find this very strange all of us educated ladies educated females highly placed in life who have carved a niche for themselves or are ready to do so they might find it strange that the issues facing girl childs are still rampant but let us not forget the other side of the picture the other side of the picture is uh i can summarize it that just yesterday i was reading about the declining sex ratio at birth in many districts of haryana in this century in this day till today we have girls people who consider girls as a burden why it for me it seems uh downright humiliating when a girl child is born and the first word that people utter is chalo koi baat nahi bahut acha mubarak why this chalo why are girls considered a burden what are we as educated females who probably have not faced these issues doing something to elevate the position to mitigate the miseries of our fellow sisters this webinar that we have organized we have specially invited speakers who renowned scholars have carved a niche for themselves in their respective fields and through education have done a lot for the females i extend them all a hearty welcome i thank them for sparing their time to be with us and i will not forget my young female colleagues who got together with this idea of celebrating or giving a wake up call on this girl child day i admit we had planned this webinar on a much larger scale offline with a workshop to train girls even in martial arts but you cannot have any say before nature and hence this webinar still i am confident that post this webinar all of us would be better aware more sensitive towards the issue and contribute in our own little ways towards our fellow sisters towards females welcome you all thank you uh, thank you ma'am thank you so much today we are here to celebrate the national girl child day keeping in view to make the society aware about the issues and concerns of girls in india for this purpose three eminent scholars and experts with us uh, the first speaker uh, of today's webinar is professor mary zone professor uh, mary zone was director at the center for women's development studies new delhi her areas of interest span the field of women studies and feminism within the social sciences with particular expertise in uh, studies pertaining to marriage and family education and labor her well known works include her report saksham measures for ensuring safety of women and programs for gender sensitization on campuses women in the world of labor interdisciplinary and intersectional perspectives child marriage in an international frame a feminist review from india a question of silence the sexual economies of modern india 
without taking more time now and uh, now i would like to uh, invite professor mary to address the audience today professor mary is going to explore her views uh, on the status of girl child in historical perspective professor mary good morning to everyone here first and foremost my uh, gratitude uh, to all of you who have uh, you know organized this occasion i think it's a very very important uh, uh, event that you are organizing uh, let me thank um, uh, professor uh, anita gill who got in touch with me uh, i also see that i think your vice chancellor is present professor karamjeet singh uh, other faculty and uh, students and well wishers uh, thank you all for uh, organizing this and uh, asking me to be part of this occasion uh, i would just like to say a little bit uh, you know I, I already many good things have been said important points have been said a very important question has been raised why are uh, why is the girl a burden a uh, very very important question and i thought uh, by way of a uh, beginnings of an answer uh, i would give you some um, background in terms of the history of this question you know all our questions have a history and you know as you as we are all trying to understand we are in 2022 and uh, you know the situation some things are seemingly better but some things may even be worse how do we make sense of this what is the context within which others have given this their effort so uh, uh and and punjab and northwest india has its own interesting histories um so let me begin a little bit with some uh, background uh, and i will broadly look at three uh, moments in our history one is the 19th century the next will be the post independence period the 1970s and 80s and then i will come to the present time that we are now post uh, you know 21st century so 19th century uh, i think all of you are very aware that you know this has been called the period of social reform uh this was the time we were you know large parts of india were under colonial rule some of course there were princely states as well uh but uh in this time starting sometime towards the end of the 18th early 19th a kind of new um uh, kind of thinking uh emerged amongst many many uh, social reformers as they were called what, what does this mean these were people mostly men to begin with and later more women also were in a position to to play their part these were people who looked at society indian society or their local communities and so on and they found or felt that all was not well and different aspects of their society struck them aspects where they could see inequalities in amongst people and amongst these inequalities there was caste based inequalities there were other social inequalities and one of these inequalities was gender based inequality and uh, this struck these people and they took it up in different uh, presidencies at the time we have the bengal presidency we have the madras presidency we have the bombay presidency and as i said other parts of the country also in different points of time and so women became part of a set of campaigns petitions to the government to make change happen and i much of this is in your textbooks in school textbooks you read about raja ramohan roy you read about uh, ishwar chandra vidya sagar in bengal um we and uh, you know the arya samaj the birth of the arya samaj in 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 fact in 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 parts of what is northwest india came later many of these all were concerned about the very issue that you the question what is the problem with the low status what is it that about india and the low status of women in our country and what i want to say here i don't want to give you a long lecture on this point what my own research and the book was very nice introduction that you gave and i have recently written a book on the on child around child marriage mm -hmm. 
as a particular instance, and I put that also in a historical perspective. What I found fascinating as a teacher in the field of women's studies, as a researcher, was if you look at the campaigns of the 19th century, they are mostly around the child. It is the child widow that becomes one of the first figures for someone like, say, uh, Ishwar Chandra uh, Vidya Sagar. He sees girls at the age of eight, nine, ten, who are child widows in Bengal, for instance. Uh, others also in other regions found a large proportion, even in South India. You know, I, I come from South India, but even it's not as though it was peculiar to any one region. Even in South India, in the princely state of Mysore, uh, of course, a little later in the course of the 19th century, similar discoveries were made. They looked at the you know, first censuses and they saw large proportions of child widows. And they asked themselves, what is this? And what is the life of a child widow? What do we do about? So uh, what, were con what were called women's issues were invariably and frequently actually about the child. And I think in our society, in modern society, the idea of a child had not really been given that much attention. That is to say, these are in fact, as somebody said, these are global issues and globally, uh, childhood as a particular phase of life was a modern idea. In pre-modern societies, there was no clear distinction beyond the first initial years of say five, six years, after five, six years or so, there was no clear idea that, okay, one has to be a child after up to a certain age and that child needs to be taken special care of. No, in the world over after the age of five or six, small children, so what we would today call a small child was part of adult society. They worked, they did the jobs along with the uh, rest of the family. The girls did the kitchen work along with the women. The boys went, uh, you know, here and there. There was no schooling in those days, except for the very rich people. Even in Europe, I'm talking across the world, even in Europe, there was nothing like schooling for everybody. Some training here or there as part of the work experience would be provided. And this was the way it was. It is in modern times from the 17th, 18th and into 19th century that childhood becomes more and more important. That ideas like child labor become considered a very bad thing. I don't know if you know, but Britain in case it was children, small children who were sent to the factories. It was small children who were sent down the mines to do the work of industrialization in those decades uh, of the 19th century. And it was only subsequently then that society said, no, this is wrong. Small children should not be uh, sent to do this kind of very dangerous work. They should be protected. They should uh, actually go to school. And schooling was begun for uh, as a national uh, English uh, idea. So similarly in India, similarly in India, the idea of the child what should children do? Children should, are children working? Is that correct or not correct? And the child, the girl, what about her? When is she, uh, how, how come she's already a widow at the age of eight or nine? How can that be correct? And she's placed in a very socially marginal situation for the rest of her days, in the, in, 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 especially in Hindu society. Uh, what do we do about these things? And so a series of campaigns, the 19th century are full of campaigns against what were thought of as bad social practices. And that is why we call it social reform. So widow remarriage was one of the major campaigns uh, against child marriage. The fact that a girl of six or seven could be married to a man of 20, 30, 40. Even some of the most famous people, I don't know if you know, but even Mahatma Gandhiji was married. Uh, you know, his wife was a 12 year old or 13 year old. Uh, so let us not forget uh, you know, that even, even the big leaders of the time were part of this society. It was not only the poor, the rural people. It was part of general society. Female infanticide was a practice that was discovered during this time in parts of North India, especially uh, where, it, you know, a family felt that an extra girl was born. And what will they do? They were, you know, in what was called Rajputana, in Punjab, uh, in other parts of North India. Baby girls, if they, if it was felt that the family could not bring her up and, 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 and protect her, a baby girl was killed. And a female infanticide then became a crime because of the campaigns that were led by our social reformers. 
education, you know, much has been said about education. The first schools were started during this time and some major leaders, Mahatma Jyoti Bafule, I don't know if you've heard of this person. He was a very major social reformer in Maharashtra. He was from a peasant family. He was an agriculturalist, but he started some of the first schools in the Western part of Maharashtra for girls and for girls from all castes, from the so-called untouchable castes, as well as from the so-called upper castes. So this is my first uh, point that I want to uh, leave with you. That is to say the 19th century is actually about the children uh, who are girl children. Uh, and we call it social reform of women. That's how you read about it. But most of the time it was actually about children and ideas of ch childhood became more and more important in our society. So this is my first moment. Uh, my second moment, I'm jumping there. Many other things happened in the early 20th century. I, I don't have time. Let me move forward to the post-independence period. That is after we gained independence from the British, after we became a nation, after we uh, started development policies uh, uh, under the new government, uh, under, under, under Nehruji, um, uh, poverty was to be eradicated. Uh, equality was to be brought in as per the constitution uh, and a whole lot of new kinds of researches were started uh, on issues around development. And sometime in the 1970s, uh, development economists, and some of them you, you may have heard of, Amartya Sen, I'm sure you've all heard of Amartya Sen, he is a Nobel Prize winner, uh, but he was one of several uh, uh, economists, both men and women, uh, who were looking at the so, you know, issues of development. They were looking at, the, at social, uh, economic, nutritional, and other issues pertaining to our country, our poverty, and how to bring us out of poverty. And what they did, what was new, was what they did was they looked inside. Usually when we talk about poverty, we talk about household level poverty, and we treat the household as a single unit. And we say this household is below the poverty line. This household is above the poverty line. And how do we bring more households above the poverty line? But they did something further. They said, we have to go inside the household. We have to look at the members within a household, the mothers, the fathers, the grandparents, the children, whether they are girls and boys, we must break up the family members if we want to understand poverty and disadvantage and uh, so on better. And when they did this, they made a rather shocking discovery. Now, I don't know if you know this, but biologically speaking, the uh, girl baby actually has a small advantage over the boy baby. More, um, uh, um, you know, um, the, the girl child as per, and I, this has to do with the chromosomal and other aspects. If anybody knows the science of it, they can, they can you know, uh, uh, think about this. But, you know, we have the uh, girls have the XX chromosome, boys have an XY chromosome, and the Y chromosome is actually an incomplete chromosome. Uh, that's why it's shaped like a Y. And the boy baby, whether in, the, whether in development, in the pre-birth stage or after birth, has a little more vulnerability, physiological vulnerability, compared to the girl. The girl, for whatever, I don't know the you know, evolutionary reasons why there's this distinction. But if you look at global data, you will see that the girl, the girl child has slightly better uh, chances of survival, uh, slightly better chances of not contracting certain diseases. And the boy, on the contrary, has slightly worse chances. So the world over, if you look at the data of small children, mortality, what we call child mortality data, it is actually skewed in favor of the girl. The figures, the sex ratio across the world is in favor of the girl. Yeah. But in India and among some other countries, not us alone, other countries too, they discovered to their shock that in our country, the sex ratios at the younger ages, the child mortality, infant mortality data showed excess female mortality. More girls than boys were dying. And this is not how it should be. Usually, especially in poorer countries, you go to poorer parts of Africa, 
more boys will be dying than girls in a situation of famine or hardship because they are the most vulnerable. So in other words, what this meant was that there was some other non-physiological, non-scientific reason for why the girl at this young age was more vulnerable, was dying more than her brothers were. And this implied social practices in our country such that this was happening. And it was in this time, it was sometime around the 1980s, and this is something I think many of us don't know, that the term girl child was invented in India. It's not anybody else's word, it's our word. It was our way of saying the girl child is endangered. And it is in countries like ours that this endangerment is happening. It is not happening in other parts of the world. You will not find the same data there. We were, in other words, taking less care of our girl children. Our girl babies were not being given the same care as the boys. They were being given less nutrition and so on, such that we were having these excess mortality rates. And subsequent to that, in the 1980s, I think this uh, we also discovered, and I think this has also in effect been mentioned by Professor Gill, in rural areas, yes, and in very poor families, yes, there was excess female mortality. But in our better off, in a slightly middle class context, in urban India, in big cities, cities like Delhi, cities like Amritsar, cities like Bombay, we discovered that families were going to clinics to get the sex of the fetus when the mother was pregnant. They went to the clinics to get the sex of the fetus checked. And if the sex was female, in many cases, the abor an abortion was undertaken rather than to bring the pregnancy to term. And so we saw a new kind of data set emerging in our country, in, in our census data and other kinds of um, medical data. We were seeing the sex ratio at birth become more and more negative. I think somebody may need to mute themselves, no problem. So the sex ratio at birth was a new kind of data that came out in the 1980s for the first time, which made it possible to actually measure pre-birth elimination of female fetuses. Because post-birth, it could be also mortality after birth. Female feticide, after all, is after birth. And excess female mortality at very young ages is after birth. But this was before birth. And unfortunately, here, Northwest India was a kind of leader, you might say, uh, in these very negative figures. And this was part of the idea that the girl child is actually endangered. The missing girl child became a new uh, slogan in the 1980s into the 1990s. And new laws were created. As you all know, sex determination testing became uh, illegal uh, and so on. So this is the second moment I want to bring to your notice that, in fact, there was this skew, a negative adverse skew that's a basic, could be measured in a very, very simple, basic way by comparing the number of girls compared to boys. And you know some of those figures. Uh, they became very bad in the 2001 census. The figure uh, dropped in some states below 800. Uh, girls per thousand boys in the zero to six age group, uh, which is a very scary figure. Um, and uh, in other, and so a lot of effort has gone into countering this and asking ourselves, why is this happening? And especially if under very poor conditions, we understand, okay, a very poor family does not know how to feed their daughter and would let her or doesn't take her to hospital. And therefore she dies, uh, you know, out of neglect. That may be one reason, but how come in a middle-class family, there is so much pressure if there is a, a, a pregnancy to get that pregnancy che checked? Why is it happening even amongst the middle class? And in the urban areas, the figures were worse than in the rural areas. So much effort, I have worked in this area, much effort went into looking into this situation and we discovered certain paradoxes. The paradox we discovered was 
that even while families are reducing the number of children, in fact, nowadays, most families don't want more than two children. They want one boy and one girl, usually in that order, then they're very, very happy. If the girl first boy should be born, everybody's happy, then they want a girl. And they will be very happy to have a girl. One boy, one girl, hum do, hamare do, everybody is very happy. Uh, but you see, uh, it doesn't work that way always. So what happens if a girl is born as the first child? Okay, you're, maybe you're a middle class family, you'll say, okay, fine. Okay, we have one girl. Then the second pregnancy happens, then what? Then they start getting a little worried because you see, in today's world, they no longer want to have, in the old days, what would happen would be you would have many more children and along you'd hope that some boys would do. So you'd have six, seven, eight births. Out of them, however many maybe they may not be wanted, they may be neglected, but they were born. But now in the new modern family in the 20, late 20th century, early 21st century, nobody wants to have more than two children. Nobody even, please understand when I'm saying they don't even want extra sons. I have done field work you know, in, in parts of Punjab and Haryana and so on. And they tell the mother, say, I, we don't want extra sons. We don't want more than two children. They're a headache. They are good for nothing. They will give us so much problems later in life. We actually only want one girl, one boy. But what do we do? They ask us if we already have a girl. Then can we then manage with the second girl and no boy in the family? What do we do? And so then you see the pattern you will see the worst sex ratios are in the second birth or the third birth, not in the first birth. Okay, so, and this is amongst our own people, not some other, you know, uh, it's amongst our own people. So this is the moment we are in today. It is still not solved. We are trying now to understand how do we solve this? And I believe we are solving it because it is a very paradoxical situation. Take the case of Punjab. You have some of the, better, in fact, figures for education for girls. You have higher ages at marriage for girls. In fact, you have very good figures, but you have very bad sex ratio figures. So once a girl is born, you want to take care of her. You want to bring her up. You want to give her good education. In fact, you have a funny situation where sometimes girls are more educated than boys. Boys are dropping out after class 10, class 12. They are no longer, you know, uh, able to manage the st studies or whatever the reasons may be. The girls, in fact, are very keen to keep studying. So if you look at your data on education, you will see a very strange thing. In some areas, there is more education amongst girls. Very keen. So we have a contradiction here with the girl child who is very keen to get ahead, who is very keen to do well in life. Parents are very worried for her safety. They want to do good things by her, but they are very concerned if they have an extra daughter, they will not manage. And they feel one son is needed to keep the family going. After all, girl will be married. She will go to the other family. She, her, her duties will be to the other family who will be there for us. So even if the son is not dependable, even if the son is you know good for nothing and so on, we need one son. So I feel if we want to make progress today, we must think about the boy child and the girl child. We must ask ourselves, are we putting too much pressure on the boys also? What are the demands on the boys? To do a good job, to manage everything, to look after us, to everything. The wife must also be dutiful and he must not go away and set up house somewhere else. We go on and on about the boys also. So I feel in order to make a better future for girls, we must make a better future for boys, which means that we must ask our government, we must ask our policymakers to create a better world for everyone. It is not just about educating the girl child. It is about educating boys and girls, about giving both boys and girls adequate employment opportunities, which we don't see very much today. Edu and I think as open university like yours is performing a very, very important function in terms of providing possible education that can possibly lead to jobs, but we don't know, it's not in your control what links are, we, are needed between society and education and employment to improve the situation for both boys and girls? When will boys feel that they can also perform duties in the home and that the woman is not the only person to take care of the home 
both can do this together and both can find a life outside the home together. So in order to make a new future for the girl child, let us then think about boys and girls in our society making equal progress. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Mary, for sharing your views on the concept of girl child in the historical perspective, that is 19th century, post-independence period, and the present time, along with the various issues related to the status, health, nutrition, child mortality, and sex selection. Thanks, Professor Mary, for giving us your valuable time. Now, I would like to invite our next speaker, Professor Neera Verma, former Dean, Faculty of Social Sciences, and Chairperson in the Department of Economics, Kurukshetra University. She also worked as Director, UGC, Human Resource Development Center. A keen researcher, having around 40 publications, and also delivered talks on issues ranging from excellence in teaching and women empowerment to developmental challenges. She is actively involved with gender issues and a master trainer for capacity building of women managers in higher education for the UGC. Her current research interests focus on gender, demography, and poverty. She will share her views on the topic of inflation, the importance of economic independence in girl child. Please, Dr. Nida Varma. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Penki. I hope I'm audible. The volume is okay. And yes, uh, all is good. Uh, so, Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor Karamjit Singhji, Dean Academic Affairs, Professor Anita Gill, uh, speakers of the day, uh, Professor Mary John, and uh, we have an expert from uh, Juvenile Board also. So I think uh, Professor Anita Gill has chosen her speakers very carefully, seeing to it that uh, there is a continuity and there is no overlap. At the outset, I would like to thank the university. I would also like to congratulate the university for taking this uh, really important initiative. Because unless we discuss, unless we really bring uh, uh, th these issues, these concerns, these challenges to the platform, we shall not be able to make any progress. That is my firm belief. So congratulations and thanks to, to the university, to the organizers, especially uh, Professor Anita for giving me this opportunity, for inviting me over and talking about something which is very, uh, uh, which is uh, very close to my heart, which is a kind of a passion with me. Uh, and uh, when she, she asked me, what do you want to speak on? Uh, naturally, I have been trained as a, as a student of economics. So naturally that comes very naturally to me, but I have been trying to be objective about it. And I have been analyzing uh, how different dimensions of uh, empowerment, whether it's empowerment of poor, whether it's empowerment of women, whether it's empowerment of any marginalized section of the society, how, how, uh, which are the dimensions which, is there a sequence? Is there a priority? Is there a hierarchy? I've been thinking very closely about it. So it is not only because I come from background of economics, but I very strongly feel that though uh, whenever you are trying to empower anything, anybody, any section of the society, uh, it has to be complementary. It is definitely mutually reinforcing. But at the same time, uh, you have to have a starting point or you have to choose your priorities. And when I look at that, I feel that economic empowerment, uh, you are free to disagree with me. In fact, uh, Professor Mary was talking about and the, the, the point where she left. I think that is where I would like to continue. The fundamental question that uh, Professor Anita Gill raised, I remember that I think three years back, there was a special chapter on meta preference for sons in the economic survey, if I remember, and there was a lot of analysis. Why uh, is it social? Is it economic? Is it cultural? 
what is it? Is it only psychological? What, what kind of, why don't we have that preference? So she said, why a preference for boys? And I think Professor Mary uh, did a, an excellent job in, you know, in a very short, in a very brief span, she tried to trace the history, how things have developed. Uh, but my take on the whole thing, and especially my argument for the day is that uh, until and unless we uh, try to empower our girls, our women, economically, other kinds of empowerment, other kinds of support, whether it is political empowerment, whether it's social empowerment, whether it's legal empowerment, or any other thing which, 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 is, which is definitely complementary to it, will not have uh, the desired results. That's my take on the whole thing. And why do I say uh, it is very important to be economically, uh, to have an economic identity. I'll not even go to the to the word economic uh, independence, though I did say that I would like to talk about inculcating economic independence, and I come to that. But even if you want, if you don't have an economic identity, the chances are you will not be even included. Participation even comes later. You are not even included because you are not an economic entity. Now, um, I think uh, many of us understand the kind of challenges that we have, the, the kind of scenario, the status that we have, overall status of women, but definitely because I want to build on the, the economic aspect of it. Uh, why is it that uh, we have a preference for boys? Let me, let me begin with it. Is it only social? Is it so important that I have a son uh, who, who can perform the rituals uh, and uh, rituals especially when I'm no more there in the world? Does it mean that much to me? Cremating me, putting my, my uh, body to rest, is that important? Is it really that the boys are going to take care of you in your old age or when you require? Why is it that we, we at least perceive it this way, that the, the, the boys are going to be available to be shouldering the responsibility? Is it that we have socialized ourselves that way? Or is it more fundamentally because the economic power, the economic reins are more or less in the hands of the men? Things are changing very slowly. I agree to it. There are only patches. You cannot even, um, uh, Mary was talking about um, the lower middle class, the middle class, rural urban. Uh, I have uh, my own reservations on that, though what she said in journal was very true. But at the same time, I find that there are patches. Even within, you cannot generalize uh, uh, that uh, the the findings do say that urban women have been going more for sex selection, sex determination tests. Uh, the rural have been going in less for that. But does it really indicate towards a different kind of a social cultural environment? Is it because of that? These are some of the questions I really want you to ponder. So my take on it is that if women were economically more independent, or if I put it more bluntly, that if women are not seen only as consumers and non-producers, as we usually do, at least in the social setup, even in the economic setup, in the, even in the economic framework, I come to that. Uh, in the social framework, they are seen only as consumers. So they become dependent. They're not seen as producers. Now, until and unless we change that perception, of women not only being consumers and hence dependents, but also being producers in a very meaningful, in a very uh, significant manner, which is which forms the foundation of our society. I'm not trying to in any way glorify. I'm not here to you know uh, to get into any kind of a men versus women. Because as Professor John very rightly said, that we have to think of the boy child and the girl child. It's not that the boy child or the boy uh, is not facing problems. The men are not facing problems. The question is, who is facing graver problems, one? 
who is at the moment more unequal in the society, more deprived in the society, more uh, marginalized in the society. And I think it's not because, uh, I mean, I'm so happy that we have a mixed uh, audience today in, the, in this webinar. Uh, you will, all of you will agree with me that whatever facts and figures you may pick up, whatever perceptions you may pick up, howsoever uh, rigid and traditional the outlook of a person may be, uh, howsoever reluctantly a person may agree, all of us will agree to the fact that women face much greater challenges even in 2022. One. Two, we do not find any uh, significant dent in uh, changing that scenario. It's not that we are not making efforts. It's not that uh, uh, specific schemes, specific efforts, specific initiatives, it may be from Plan International, it may be the UN doing wonderful jobs, it may be uh, right from academia to the activists who are making efforts of all kinds. But the question is how much of the ground, ground reality is changing? And that is what makes me think that uh, at least in India, that goes for whole of South Asia, that goes even for the whole of the developing world. But even if we, uh, our, uh, we confine ourselves to India today, I feel that one big perceptive change that we need to bring in today, uh, right from the birth of the child, is that we inculcate, we instill in them a sense of economic entity. Uh, knowingly, unknowingly, consciously, unconsciously, it happens that uh, the girl are not so much motivated, or if you want to neutralize it, they are not so much under stress to take up a career, to take up a job, to 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 uh, to understand that she too has to earn a living for herself. In most of the households, be it lower, lower class, it may be lower middle, upper middle, the higher, uh, I would, I, again, I will say there, there may be islands, there might be certain patches where things may be slightly different and that, that can, they can be taken as uh, role models. But beyond that, we might be having names, we might be having uh, institutions, but beyond that, the kind of upbringing a uh, two year, three year, four year girl child is getting is, she should behave in a particular manner. Not that boys are not told to behave. What I'm saying is that the, the norms are different. I'll not even say they are, uh, they are harsher. Let me not get into that uh, debate today, but the norms are different. Why don't we try to bring a, uh, more universal norm or code of conduct of bringing up the, the children. Telling that, that education, career, uh, earning a livelihood is the responsibility and privilege of both sexes. Now, this is something where the family atmosphere, of course, the community uh, can reinforce it. The national schemes can reinforce it. But I think it is very important if we really want to change uh, uh, things. And this, this, I mean, economic empowerment, it is not something which will come, you know, uh, through uh, simply through a number of government schemes be it Ujwala, be it Mudra, be it uh, Beti Bachao, Beti Padhao. Beti Bachao, Beti Padhao has done a good job. It, it, has, it has shown results. But then Beti Padhakar, what do we want to do? Along with education, it is, it is very important. Every year of education research says, uh, every additional year of education to a girl uh, can add up to eight to 10% of wage increase in a girl's job and girl's career. But the question is, we do not give them that dream. We do not uh, inculcate that sense. 
I mean, I, I don't know how it happened, but in my case, my mother was very, very, uh, and that is why maybe it is very, uh, I have really grown up on that. My mother was very sure that both uh, me and my sister should become economically independent and only then she will marry us. Now, very clear. That was one message that was given to us from the very beginning. And uh, believe you me, I was the worst of the three uh, siblings. Uh, not good in studies, very average, very so. So they were very disappointed in me. In me and my mother was very scared that what will happen to her. Uh, I mean, will she be able to make a living? Now that was that idea that I have to make a living. I have to live for myself. It's very shocking. I don't know how many of you, but I would really like it's a four minute video. Please look at that video. It's available on uh, United Nations. I think it's available on Plan International. It's about Malawi. And it was shocking to me. I watched it last week only. They say that now that we have a youth club and women are, uh, girls are, in fact, not women, girls are learning skills. They are trying to earn their own livelihood. They are getting connected with the markets. Now they don't have to depend on their boyfriends for their daily expenses. And they don't have to, uh, to offer sexual favors in order to get their pocket money. So that is the kind of... You know, every country, every community is having its own challenges. So I feel very strongly that we as parents, we as family must uh, inculcate uh, in our girls an equal responsibility, equal need for earning a livelihood. I, I'm not, I don't want to go into many figures. Many of you must be aware, but still, just to tell you the kind of reference that is there. For example, unfortunately, if you look at 2004, the women participation in labor force was 35%. It came down to 29%. And uh, the 2017-18 says it's merely 23.3%. I'm sure COVID must have made it even worse. And the more disturbing thing is, if there is a 31% gap. Now, how... how uh, Things are, uh, you know, um, I'll say wrong correlations are established. I've heard many people argue that, well, the women will take away men's jobs. You are trying to bridge that gap. There'll be only a reallocation. I strongly disagree. And that is why Amrata Sen, who was referred by the earlier speaker also, he said that uh, gender equality or gender empowerment is not a woman's issue. It's a society's issue. I agree that there, there, there need to be some readjustments. There have to be some uh, redefinitions. The, I mean, you look at agricultural labor, 40%, 42% of the agricultural labor is women. And you look at the land holding, less than 9%. You look at the work that women do. Now, this is another very ironical thing, especially in India. All over the world, international vocabulary goes like that only. But you differentiate between work and employment. Women work, yes. Women are employed? No. Now, either you start valuing. I'm not saying that necessarily you have to, when I say economic independence, it doesn't necessarily mean that you, it will be very desirable to make a balance between unpaid uh, uh, care work and paid work. That is also very important. I will not say that you just glorify. Uh, Anita ji started with Ashtami and that was wonderful. But uh, Anita ji, I, I just want to say that uh, that is also not at times very fair when women are put on a pedestal, but they are not given the equal rights. I'm ready to worship you, but I'm not ready to give you equality it's because worship will happen once or twice a day. What happens to the rest of these things? So, it is, it is not about uh, only, you know, women only earning in that sense. So we really needed to bridge that gap between work and employment. I'm working. And when I'm working, that means I'm employed. The economic definition of being employed may be slightly different. I agree. It may be different. Let the economists stay with that def with definition, with that definition. But don't you think that in our socio-cultural setup, we need to recognize the work in the sense that this is the saving. For example, uh, there has been uh, quite a big revision. But let me stay with the latest figures. IMF says that if there was a gender equality in terms of employment between men and women. India's GDP is going to increase by $2.9 trillion by 2025. $3 trillion. 
it's it's astonishing i i say that you you may uh, adjust it with for any error term you may reduce it by 10% 20% 25% still it's a staggering figure and who's gaining the whole of the society is gaining so i feel that uh, uh, that uh, apart from all kinds of strategies that we need to have we have so much of data we have so much of uh, you know information we have we know that our uh, girls in in within their homes are learning so many skills why don't we tell them that this is a skill that you can inculcate and you can make it a source of livelihood that idea is never given to her i i don't say that you have to necessarily why is uh, somebody did say that care work needs to be more balancedly uh, shared it is happening but it is happening largely because of the forced circumstances it is very very remotely being undertaken by choice if you think that our the women's work women's domestic care it is such a good thing it is such an important thing if you really feel that way don't you want to be a part of that important thing i think earlier historically it was very convenient there was a division of work there was nothing wrong in it but when that division of work was undertaken uh, labels were not attached to them uh, hierarchy was not attached to them this is menial work this is glorified work over the years it happened and it happened mainly because women did not have their own economic independence so until and unless we teach both our girls as well as our boys i don't say one of them we teach our boys also to how to behave how to uh, to communicate how to live with a woman who has her own sources of income it's very unfortunate because so much of your uh, thoughts you gather from families from informal informations informal discussions which are not uh, necessarily intellectual and academic one of my family members once said that the divorce rate is going up because women are becoming economically independent but it was very to me uh, i said okay let me conceptualize my thoughts on it and i will get back to it but it's very shocking now if you look at it superficially yes it may be happening because both parties don't know how to exercise that newly found independence of women both parties and that may be leading to more of irritation because you you have got used to a particular set of structure within the society if we train our both our boys and girls that your work uh is important your work must bring in some kind of economic independence and that economic independence of both boys and girls will be good for the family as such we go back to boss rep in 50s and 60s she documented it that uh, women's income makes a different kind of an impact on the society and today also we have uh, studies which say that uh, women tend to spend 90% of their income on the family and when they say my family what is it health education better food nutrition i mean the the thing is that if women are or girl child is made to be economically independent many of the social problems will also have a greater probability of being reduced i don't say that it change why dowry why domestic violence why why is it that she is not able to stand i mean i have seen the the upper middle class families telling their their daughters no you stay there you don't have a source of income i'm not saying that that, that should you know the, the institution of marriage gets into danger that that thing should not happen the thing is we need to teach our girl child and our boy child to live in a changed structure of the society where both of them need to take care of the domestic chores need to take care of the uh, the the uh, family the children the elder depending upon how they they build their careers i'm sorry to say but in western uh, western uh, you know society 
I'm not, I'm not saying that all is well with them, but at least at gender equality, I have not seen a single girl there, be it uh, Indian American, be it uh, uh, American, be it from any, any nationality. They know that they have to get educated and they have to find some source of livelihood. Why isn't it happening in India? Why is that even the men are so insecure of it? Now, because cost of living is going up, as uh, Professor John was saying, that uh, in China has, you know, shifted to two-child two policy uh, some three, four years back, but it is not bearing any results because children, uh, parents feel that having a child is a very expensive affair. So definitely they will start, stop at two. The question is, why do we feel that boys will be better? My strong take on the thing is, it is not purely social. It is not purely cultural. It is not purely psychological. A greater part of it is because women are not economically independent, girls are not, do not have their own money if they want to take care of their children, if they want to take care of their parents. So the parents feel that because they don't have a say in the household, they'll not be able to take care of them. If I don't have to ask uh, my family uh, whether or no, not I can go to my parents' house, whether I can afford a ticket uh, to, for traveling, whether I can spend on their uh, medical care, I think things will slowly change. And if you agree, I don't know. I agree that, uh, I mean, as things change, women may not be spending 90% of their income on the families, which will be in a way good because they'll be blowing back some of their income into investment in their own careers, which is very important. They need to grow. And if we are able to bring that change in the mindset of the families so that they, they, they start inculcating that feeling, the need, the urgency, the, the, uh, the, the significance of being economically independent. Whatever we may say, until and unless uh, we say that money makes the mayor go, you, you just can't. I mean, you may be knowing all the legal rights. I don't have the money to file uh, a complaint or hire a lawyer. What do I do with that legal knowledge? So I think I'm not saying that economic empowerment is all, but I do feel that if we instill that kind of a, a need for economic independence in our uh, girls right from the beginning. And not that you just instill it, at the, it's, it's, it's going to be a, a lifetime thing. And it has to be reinforced with skill formation, with technology upgradation, with education, with, uh, with, the, with you know, training how they can handle their money. They don't know how to handle their money. Even in the best of the workshops I have seen that women are very comfortable or at best apologetic, they don't know about investments. I come from a discipline of economics. Somebody asked me what's happening to the share market. I says, I'm sorry, that's not my area. I don't invest in that. But I mean, if somebody asked me, okay, what could be the good investment options? As a student of economics, at least I should be able to intelligently talk about it. How do I get uh, away, uh, get uh, you know, away from that situation or wriggle out of that situation? Is I say I'm a woman and uh, you know, the family handles, my husband handles, or somebody else. No, why? Because you've not been trained, and there has been no pressure on you, either from the family, from the society, uh, from your uh, work environment, that you should be able to handle your money. Now, these are the things I think, of course, uh, you know, converting work into employment, uh, giving a dignity to domestic care, that certainly has to go into it. But I think the moment the women start becoming economically independent, they can go out and take up jobs, they can create opportunities or take out jobs, not necessarily, maybe they're self-employed. So there is a time constraint. You have to allocate your time. The moment you feel that there is a, an opportunity cost of your taking care of your family. I think that uh, that uh, sense of uh, appreciation, recognition is also likely to come with it. I don't say it will necessarily come because even uh, I've seen people or women who are employed may not be decision makers. But the question is, are you moving in the right direction? 
You say it's not getting done. Slowly it will get done. When we had the 73rd, 74th amendment, I mean, it was at least in Haryana. And uh, I think uh, Professor Anita mentioned that Haryana is not, uh, I mean, I really feel very, um, very sad about it. But that is the state of affairs. But the question is, in Haryana, Punjab, there is another angle also, the land distribution, the, the inheritance of the land. That is also another issue which, you know, uh, creates that kind of, a, you know, preference for the, for the boy because the boy will inherit the land and it will not get uh, divided. Uh, they don't want it to go to another house. So those issues are also there. But I think it is very important that in order to bring about faster and more sustainable empowerment of women, girl child and society at large. And also in order to make a greater dent on the social issues, I think it is important that we, we try to tell our girl children that you, just as your brother, as your other uh, male members in the family, you too need to earn your living. I'll stop here. I don't know. I, I thought uh, I'll talk about global gender gap index and all those things, but I think uh, I became more uh, carried away by the thing, by the, the basic argument that I wanted to share with you today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, ma'am. Professor Neera Verma ponders light on the different dimensions of women empowerment and the importance of economic independence for girls. It's a pleasure to listen to you, ma'am. Thank you so much. After listening to uh, Professor Mary, Professor Neera, now is the time for our third speaker, Dr. Madanjeet Kaur Sahuta. She is the member Juvenile Justice Court, Chandigarh. She is also the member of other organizations like Consumer Disputes Wrestle Forum, and Child Welfare Committee Bench of Magistrates. She's educational educationist. She did masters in public administration, religious studies and physical education. In addition to this, she did LLB, LLM and PhD. She has done exemplary work in various social and educational fields, especially child rights protection and promotion. Today, she is with us on behalf of our university. I would like to invite Dr. Madanjeet Kaur Sohota to speak on women and Sikhism in today's society. Dr. Madanjeet Kaur Sohota, ma'am, please. Ma'am, unmute yourself. Dr. Madanjeet. Is it okay? Yes, ma'am, right. Okay, okay. Thank you, Ji. I am very happy that you have a lot of speakers in this galaxy. I speakers to ask you to ask you to ask you to ask you to बहुत ही इंपॉर्टेंट विषय है सो so, सब तो पहला मैं सत्कारयोग वाइस चांसलर साहब प्रोफेसर डॉक्टर करमजीत सिंह डॉक्टर अनीता गिल जी प्रोफेसर जीएस बत्रा डायरेक्टर प्लानिंग एंड मॉनिटरिंग देन डॉक्टर गुरलीन कौर सारियां नु मैं मुबारकबाद दिनी हूं Happy Girl Child Day to you all and congratulations you too for choosing this day in consonance of teachings of Baba Guru Nanak Dev Ji Jinna ne kiha si pand jamiye, pand nimiye, pand mangan vyaho, pando hove dosti, pando chale raho, pand moa, pand paliye, pand hoye vandan, so kyo manda akhiye jit jamme rajan pando hi pand upje pande baj na koye nanak pande bahara eko sacha soye mohar laga ditti baba nanak ji ne ke jehdi sari srishti hai oh keval te keval 
ਪੰਡ ਜਾਨੀ ਔਰਤ ਦੇ ਦੁਆਲੇ ਘੁੰਮਦੀ ਹੈ ਔਰਤ ਤੋਂ ਹੀ ਜੇ ਸ੍ਰਿਸ਼ਟੀ ਪੈਦਾ ਹੁੰਦੀ ਹੈ ਔਰਤ ਤੋਂ ਹੀ ਔਰਤ ਪੈਦਾ ਹੁੰਦੀ ਹੈ ਔਰਤ ਅਗਰ ਨਾ ਹੋਵੇ ਤੇ ਔਰਤ ਨੂੰ ਹੋਰ ਲੱਭਿਆ ਜਾਂਦਾ ਹੈ ਆਖਿਰ ਵਿੱਚ ਬਾਬਾ ਜੀ ਨੇ ਕਿਹਾ ਹੈ ਕਿ ਜੋ ਔਰਤ ਤੋਂ ਪੈਦਾ ਨਹੀਂ ਹੁੰਦਾ ਉਹ ਕੇਵਲ ਤੇ ਕੇਵਲ ਇੱਕ ਸੱਚਾ ਪਾਤਸ਼ਾਹੀ ਹੈ ਸੋ ਮੇਰਾ ਖਿਆਲ ਹੈ ਇੰਨਾ ਵੱਡਾ ਇੰਨਾ ਵੱਡਾ ਸਥਾਨ ਇੰਨਾ ਵੱਡਾ ਉੱਚ ਸਥਾਨ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਗੁਰੂ ਨਾਨਕ ਦੇਵ ਜੀ ਨੇ ਇਸ ਸ੍ਰਿਸ਼ਟੀ ਨੂੰ ਬਖਸ਼ਿਆ ਮੇਰਾ ਖਿਆਲ ਹੈ ਉਹ ਤੋਂ ਬਾਅਦ ਲੱਗਦਾ ਹੈ ਕਿ ਅਗਰ ਅਸੀਂ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਟੀਚਿੰਗਸ ਨੂੰ ਪੜਿਆ ਹੁੰਦਾ ਗੁੜਿਆ ਹੁੰਦਾ ਹਿਰਦੇ 'ਚ ਵਸਾਇਆ ਹੁੰਦਾ ਆਪਣੇ ਜੀਵਨ ਵਿੱਚ ਅਮਲੀ ਜੀਵਨ ਹੰਡਾਇਆ ਹੁੰਦਾ ਤਾਂ ਸ਼ਾਇਦ ਜਿਹੜੀਆਂ ਅੱਜ ਅਸੀਂ ਗਰਲ ਚਾਈਲਡ ਡੇ ਮਨਾਉਣ ਦੀ ਜ਼ਰੂਰਤ ਪੈ ਰਹੀ ਹੈ ਸ਼ਾਇਦ ਇਹ ਅਵੇਅਰਨੈਸ ਸਦੀਆਂ ਪਹਿਲਾਂ ਹੋਈ ਹੁੰਦੀ ਪਰ ਚਲੋ देयर ਆਈ ਦਰੁਸਤ ਆਏ ਗਵਰਨਮੈਂਟ ਆਫ ਇੰਡੀਆ ਨੇ ਮਿਨਿਸਟਰੀ ਆਫ ਵਿਮਨ ਐਂਡ ਚਾਈਲਡ ਡਿਵੈਲਪਮੈਂਟ ਨੇ 2008 ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਇਹ ਪ੍ਰਣ ਲਿਆ ਕਿ ਕਿਉਂ ਨਾ ਇੱਕ ਸਪੈਸ਼ਲ ਡੇ ਮਨਾਇਆ ਜਾਵੇ ਜਿਸ ਨੂੰ ਨੈਸ਼ਨਲ ਗਰਲ ਚਾਈਲਡ ਡੇ ਵਜੋਂ ਮਨਾਇਆ ਜਾਵੇ ਸੋ ਇਹ 24 ਜਨਵਰੀ ਫਿਕਸ ਕੀਤੀ ਗਈ ਸੋ ਮੈਂ ਸੈਲੂਟ ਕਰਦੀ ਆ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਯੋਗ ਦਿਮਾਗਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਜਿਨ੍ਹਾਂ ਨੇ ਐਟਲੀਸਟ ਇਹ ਸੋਚਿਆ ਕਿ ਕਮ ਸੇ ਕਮ ਦਿਨ ਮਨਾਇਆ ਜਾਵੇ ਮੇਰਾ ਭਾਵ ਹੈ ਕਿ ਦਿਨ ਮਨਾਉਣਾ ਇੱਕ ਅੱਛੀ ਗੱਲ ਹੈ ਕਿਉਂਕਿ ਦਿਨ ਮਨਾਉਣ ਦੇ ਨਾਲ ਅਸੀਂ ਜਿੱਥੇ ਅਵੇਅਰ ਹੁੰਨੇ ਆ ਜਾਗਰਤ ਹੁੰਨੇ ਆ ਉੱਥੇ ਸਾਨੂੰ ਆਪਣੀ ਰਿਸਪੌਂਸਿਬਿਲਟੀ ਦਾ ਡਿਊਟੀ ਦਾ ਵੀ ਅਹਿਸਾਸ ਹੁੰਦਾ ਹੈ ਕਿ ਲੜਕੀ ਜੀ ਤੋਂ ਬਿਨਾ ਸਮਾਜ ਦੀ ਐਗਜ਼ਿਸਟੈਂਸ ਹੀ ਸੰਭਵ ਨਹੀਂ ਉਸ ਨੂੰ ਅਸੀਂ ਕਿਵੇਂ ਦੁਰਕਾਰ ਸਕਦੇ ਹਾਂ ਉਹਨੇ ਡਾਕਟਰ ਅਨੀਤਾ ਗਿੱਲ ਨੇ ਕਿਹਾ ਸੀ ਕਿ ਇਹ ਬਰਡਨ ਨਹੀਂ ਹੈ ਮੈਂ ਐਡ ਕਰਦੀ ਹਾਂ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਦੇ ਨਾਲ ਕਿ ਚਾਈਲਡ ਗਰਲ ਚਾਈਲਡ ਇਜ਼ ਨਾਟ ਅ ਬਰਡਨ ਬਟ ਐਨ ਐਸੈਟ ਇਹ ਦੁਰਭਾਗਿਆ ਹੈ ਕਿ ਅਸੀਂ ਅੱਜ ਦੀ ਸਾਇੰਸ ਟੈਕਨੋਲੋਜੀ ਨੂੰ ਯੂਜ਼ ਕਰਕੇ ਮਿਸਯੂਜ਼ ਕਰਕੇ ਅਸੀਂ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਹੈਗਾ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਸਾਡੀ ਸੈਕਸ ਰੇਸ਼ੋ ਹੈਗੀ ਹੈ ਉਹ ਬੜੀ ਹੀ ਨੀਚੇ ਜਾ ਰਹੀ ਹੈ ਮੇਰਾ ਖਿਆਲ ਹੈ ਬੜਾ ਹੀ ਸਮਾਜ ਨੂੰ ਜਿੱਥੇ ਜਾਗਰਤ ਹੋਣ ਦੀ ਲੋੜ ਹੈ ਜਿੱਥੇ ਉਸ ਨੂੰ ਆਪਣੀ ਡਿਊਟੀ ਨਿਭਾਉਣ ਦੀ ਲੋੜ ਹੈ ਉੱਥੇ ਸਮਾਜ ਵਿੱਚ ਜਿਹੜੀਆਂ ਔਰਤਾਂ ਹਨ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਖੁਦ ਨੂੰ ਵੀ ਵੈਲ ਆਰਮਡ ਹੋਣ ਦੀ ਲੋੜ ਹੈ ਜਿੱਥੇ ਵੀ ਜਾਂ ਮਾਂ ਦੇ ਰੂਪ ਵਿੱਚ ਜਾਂ ਭੈਣ ਦੇ ਰੂਪ ਵਿੱਚ ਜਾਂ ਪਤਨੀ ਦੇ ਰੂਪ ਵਿੱਚ ਬੇਟੀ ਦੇ ਰੂਪ ਵਿੱਚ ਸਾਰਿਆਂ ਨੂੰ ਹੀ ਸਾਨੂੰ ਸੁਹਿਰਦ ਹੋਣਾ ਪਏਗਾ ਤਾਂ ਐਸੀ ਕੋਈ ਗੱਲ ਨਹੀਂ ਕਿ ਕੁਝ ਅਚੀਵ ਕੀਤਾ ਨਾ ਜਾ ਸਕੇ ਲੈਟਸ ਰੈਕਗਨਾਈਜ਼ ਦ ਰਾਈਟ ਆਫ ਗਰਲਸ ਐਂਡ देयर ਪ੍ਰੋਬਲਮ ਟੂ ਗਿਵ ਦੈਮ ਅ ਬੈਟਰ ਲਾਈਫ ਐਂਡ ਅ ਬੈਟਰ ਫਿਊਚਰ ਦ ਡੇ ਰਿਮਾਈਂਡਸ ਅਸ ਆਵਰ ਰਿਸਪੌਂਸਿਬਿਲਟੀ ਟੂ ਗਿਵ ਦੈਮ ਦ ਇੰਪੋਰਟੈਂਸ ਦੇ ਡਿਜ਼ਰਵ ਐਂਡ ਵਰਕ ਟੂਗੇਦਰ ਫॉर देयर happier life they have been discriminated and sufferings were there since long let's get their honor back and ensures a happy healthy life full of hopes this world will be a better place once we have started this celebration into a uh, reality let it turn into a reality for this we have to work together wholeheartedly to make this dream come true because girl child is the sweetest blessing and most beautiful creation of god the celebration started to offer more respect more support and new opportunities to the girls in the country as i am presently working in juvenile justice board you know child uh, uh, act has come into existence because despite so many acts in the fray just like domestic violence act 2009 dowry prohibition act child marriage act hone uh, hone ek speaker
ਜਿਹੜੇ ਫੇਵਰ ਕਰਦੇ ਆ ਇਸੇ ਤਰ੍ਹਾਂ ਹੀ ਕੰਪਲਸਰੀ ਐਜੂਕੇਸ਼ਨ ਫਰਮ ਦਾ ਏਜ ਆਫ 6 ਟੂ 14 ਫਾਰ ਬੋਥ ਸੈਕਸਸ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਚੀਜ਼ਾਂ ਨੇ ਬਿਨਾ ਸ਼ੱਕ ਸਕੂਲ ਦਾ ਨੰਬਰ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਹੈਗਾ ਉਹ ਜ਼ਰੂਰ ਵਧਾਇਆ ਹੈ ਲੇਕਿਨ ਸਾਇੰਸ ਸਟ੍ਰੀਮ ਕਹਿ ਦਈਏ ਤੇ ਟੈਕਨੋਲੋਜੀ ਸਟ੍ਰੀਮ ਕਹਿ ਲਈਏ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਵਿੱਚ ਹਜੇ ਵੀ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਨੰਬਰ ਹੈਗਾ ਲੜਕੀਆਂ ਦਾ ਉਹ ਬਹੁਤ ਘੱਟ ਹੈ ਬਹੁਤ ਸਾਰੀਆਂ ਸਕੀਮਾਂ ਜਿਹੜੀਆਂ ਨੇ ਗਵਰਨਮੈਂਟ ਆਫ ਇੰਡੀਆ ਵੱਲੋਂ ਬੇਟੀ ਬਚਾਓ ਬੇਟੀ ਪੜਾਓ ਬਹੁਤ ਸਾਰੇ ਪ੍ਰੋਗਰਾਮ ਜਿਸ ਤਰ੍ਹਾਂ ਬਚਪਨ ਬਚਾਓ ਇਸੇ ਤਰ੍ਹਾਂ ਹੀ ਸਾਨੂੰ ਕਾਨੂੰਨ ਕਹਿੰਦਾ ਹੈ ਕਿ ਟੈਂਡਰ ਏਜ ਆਫ ਦਾ ਚਾਈਲਡ ਨਾਟ ਟੂ ਬੀ ਅਬਿਊਜ਼ ਐਟ ਐਟ ਐਨੀ ਕਾਸਟ ਸਾਨੂੰ ਕਨਸਟੀਟਿਊਸ਼ਨ ਵੱਲੋਂ ਆਰਟੀਕਲ 14 ਜਿਹੜਾ ਹੈਗਾ ਰਾਈਟ ਟੂ ਇਕੁਐਲਿਟੀ ਦਿੰਦਾ ਹੈ ਆਰਟੀਕਲ 15 3 ਜਿਹੜਾ ਹੈਗਾ ਉਹ ਪ੍ਰੋਹਿਬਟ ਕਰਦਾ ਹੈ ਕਿ ਕੋਈ ਵੀ ਡਿਸਕ੍ਰਿਮੀਨੇਸ਼ਨ ਔਨ ਦਾ ਬੇਸਿਸ ਆਫ ਜੈਂਡਰ ਐਟਸੈਟਰਾ ਨਹੀਂ ਹੋਣੀ ਚਾਹੀਦੀ ਆਰਟੀਕਲ 21 ਲਾਈ ਰਾਈਟ ਟੂ ਲਾਈਫ ਐਂਡ ਲਿਬਰਟੀ ਪ੍ਰੋਵਾਈਡ ਕਰਦਾ ਹੈ ਹਰ ਸਿਟੀਜ਼ਨ ਨੂੰ ਇੰਡੀਆ ਦਾ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਵੀ ਨਾਗਰਿਕ ਹੈਗਾ ਉਹਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਐਡ ਕੀਤਾ ਗਿਆ ਆਰਟੀਕਲ 21 ਏ ਕੀਪਿੰਗ ਇਨ ਟੂ ਮਾਈਂਡ ਕਿ ਲਾਈਫ ਰਾਈਟ ਟੂ ਲਾਈਫ ਐਂਡ ਲਿਬਰਟੀ ਇਨ ਆਈਸੋਲੇਸ਼ਨ ਇਜ਼ ਨਾਟ ਇਨਫ ਅੰਟਿਲ ਐਂਡ ਅਨਲੈਸ ਬੱਚਿਆਂ ਨੂੰ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਐਜੂਕੇਸ਼ਨ ਦਾ ਰਾਈਟ ਦਿੱਤਾ ਜਾਂਦਾ ਹੈ ਇਸੇ ਤਰ੍ਹਾਂ ਹੀ ਆਰਟੀਕਲ 39 ਈ ਐਂਡ ਐਫ ਆਰਟੀਕਲ 45 47 ਇਹ ਜਿੱਥੇ ਸਟੇਟ ਨੂੰ ਐਮਪਾਵਰ ਕਰਦਾ ਹੈ ਕਿ ਔਰਤਾਂ ਵਾਸਤੇ ਬੱਚਿਆਂ ਵਾਸਤੇ ਸਪੈਸ਼ਲ ਪ੍ਰੋਵੀਜਨ ਕ੍ਰੀਏਟ ਕਰੇ ਕੀਤੇ ਜਾਣ ਉੱਥੇ ਹੀ ਬੇਸਿਕ ਹਿਊਮਨ ਰਾਈਟਸ ਨੂੰ ਪ੍ਰੋਟੈਕਟ ਕਰਨ ਵਾਸਤੇ ਕਿ ਕਿਸੇ ਤਰ੍ਹਾਂ ਦੀ ਵੀ ਬੱਚਿਆਂ ਨੂੰ ਐਕਸਪਲੋਇਟੇਸ਼ਨ ਨਾ ਹੋਵੇ ਫੈਕਟਰੀਆਂ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਜਾਂ ਡਿਜ਼ਾਸਟਰਸ ਅਦਾਰਿਆਂ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਇੱਕ ਸਰਟਨ ਏਜ ਤੋਂ ਨੀਚੇ ਕੰਮ ਨਾ ਕਰਾਇਆ ਜਾਵੇ ਇਸੇ ਤਰ੍ਹਾਂ ਹੀ ਚਾਈਲਡ ਲੇਬਰ ਦੀ ਪ੍ਰੋਹਿਬਿਸ਼ ਐਕਟ ਹੈਗਾ ਬੈਗਰੀ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਹੈਗੀ ਪ੍ਰੋਹਿਬਟਡ ਬਾਈ ਲਾ ਹੈਗਾ देयर इज ए ਪਲੇਥੋਰਾ ਆਫ ਕਨਸਟੀਟਿਊਸ਼ਨਸ ਲੈਜਿਸਲੇਸ਼ਨ ਵਿਚ ਆਰ ਕਨਸਟੀਟਿਊਟਡ ਟੂ ਪ੍ਰੋਟੈਕਟ ਦ ਚਿਲਡਰਨ ਐਜ਼ ਵੈਲ ਐਜ਼ ਦ ਗਰਲ ਚਾਈਲਡ ਸਟਿਲ ਦ ਸਿਚੁਏਸ਼ਨ ਇਜ਼ ਗਲੂਮੀ ਵਾਈ ਬਿਕਾਜ਼ ਬਿਕਾਜ਼ ਆਫ ਦ ਫੈਕਟ that society is not sensitized children are being exploited at every nook and corner we all know they have been they have to work for the better economic condition of their families te kita ki jaye main e mandi ha ki jehda sikh itihas hai inna ameer hai jithe bachiyan nu agar tusi mata gujar kaur ji da ਤੁਸੀਂ ਅਗਰ ਪੜੋ ਇਤਿਹਾਸ ਪੜੋ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੇ ਜਿਸ ਵੇਲੇ ਸਹਿਬਜ਼ਾਦਿਆਂ ਨੂੰ ਸੂਬੇ ਦੀ ਕਚਹਿਰੀ ਵਿੱਚ ਪੇਸ਼ ਹੋਣਾ ਸੀਗਾ ਤੇ ਮਾਤਾ ਜੀ ਨੇ ਪੋਤਿਆਂ ਨੂੰ ਕੀ ਕਿਹਾ ਸੀ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੇ ਕਿਹਾ ਸੀਗਾ ਕਿ ਦੇਖੋ ਬੱਚਿਓ ਤੁਸੀਂ ਗੁਰ ਤੇਗ ਬਹਾਦਰ ਜੀ ਦੇ ਪੋਤੇ ਹੋ ਤੁਸੀਂ ਗੁਰੂ ਗੋਬਿੰਦ ਸਿੰਘ ਜੀ ਦੇ ਲਾਡਲੇ ਹੋ ਐਂਡ ਅਵਾ ਬੋਲ ਤੁਸੀਂ ਗੁਰੂ ਨਾਨਕ ਦੇਵ ਜੀ ਦੇ ਸਿੱਖ ਹੋ ਬਿਲਕੁਲ ਇਸ ਚੀਜ਼ ਦੀ ਲਾਜ ਰੱਖਣੀ ਹੈ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਬੱਚਿਆਂ ਨੇ ਇਹ ਸਾਬਤ ਕਰ ਦਿੱਤਾ ਕਿ ਆਤਮਿਕ ਬਲ ਅਤੇ ਉਮਰ ਦਾ ਕੋਈ ਆਪਸ ਵਿੱਚ ਕਲੈਸ਼ ਨਹੀਂ ਹੈ ਜਿਸ ਟਾਈਮ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਮਾਸੂਮ ਬੱਚਿਆਂ ਨੂੰ ਪੇਸ਼ ਕੀਤਾ ਗਿਆ ਮੈਂ ਇਹ ਉਸ ਨੂੰ ਜ਼ਰੂਰ 1 ਮਿੰਟ ਵਿੱਚ ਦੱਸਣਾ ਚਾਹੂੰਗੀ ਤੇ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਪੁੱਛਿਆ ਗਿਆ ਕਿ ਦੇਖੋ ਤੁਹਾਡੀ ਉਮਰ ਛੋਟੀ ਹੈ ਅਗਰ ਤੁਹਾਨੂੰ ਛੱਡ ਦਿੱਤਾ ਜਾਵੇ ਤਾਂ ਕੀ ਕਰੋਗੇ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਦਾ ਜਵਾਬ ਸੀ ਜੰਗਲਾਂ ਵਿੱਚ ਜਾਵਾਂਗੇ ਸਿੰਘ ਇਕੱਠੇ ਕਰਾਂਗੇ ਸ਼ਾਸਤਰ ਇਕੱਠੇ ਕਰਾਂਗੇ ਘੋੜਿਆਂ ਉੱਪਰ ਚੜਾਂਗੇ ਤੇ ਤੁਹਾਡੇ ਨਾਲ ਲੜਾਂਗੇ ਦਿਸ ਵਾਸ ਦਾ ਸਪਿਰਟ ਗਿਵਨ ਬਾਈ ਦ
ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਬਹੁਤ ਸ਼ਰਮਿੰਦਗੀ ਦਾ ਸਾਹਮਣਾ ਕਰਨਾ ਪਿਆ ਤੇ ਮਾਤਾ ਭਾਤ ਕੌਰ ਜੀ ਦੀ ਅਗਵਾਈ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਵਾਪਸ ਚਲੇ ਗਏ ਤੇ ਜਾ ਕੇ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੇ ਖਿਦਰਾਣੇ ਦੀ ਟਾਪ ਜੀ ਨੂੰ ਅੱਜ ਕੱਲ ਮੁਕਤਸਰ ਕਿਹਾ ਜਾਂਦਾ ਹੈ 40 ਮੁਕਤੇ ਲੜਦੇ ਸ਼ਹੀਦ ਹੋ ਗਏ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੇ ਬਹੁਤ ਵੱਡੀ ਸੈਨਾ ਦੇ ਨਾਲ ਮੁਗਤ ਸੈਨਾ ਦਾ ਮੁਕਾਬਲਾ ਕੀਤਾ ਆਪਣੀਆਂ ਚਾਦਰਾਂ ਲਾ ਕੇ ਤੰਬੂ ਤਾਂ ਦਿੱਤੇ ਇਹ ਦੱਸਣ ਵਾਸਤੇ ਕਿ ਬਹੁਤ ਜ਼ਿਆਦਾ ਸਾਡਾ ਨੰਬਰ ਹੈ ਅਤੇ ਆਪ ਪੋਜੀਸ਼ਨਾਂ ਲੈ ਰਹੀਆਂ ਜਿਸ ਟਾਈਮ ਉਹ ਸ਼ਹੀਦ ਹੁੰਦੇ ਨੇ ਗੁਰੂ ਗੋਬਿੰਦ ਸਿੰਘ ਜੀ ਨੂੰ ਦਸਵੇਂ ਪਾਤਸ਼ਾਹ ਨੂੰ ਪਤਾ ਲੱਗਿਆ ਤੋਂ ਉਹ ਆਉਂਦੇ ਨੇ ਤੇ ਉਹ ਇੱਕ ਇੱਕ ਦਾ ਮੱਥਾ ਚੁੰਮ ਕੇ ਕਿਸੇ ਨੂੰ 5000 ਹਜ਼ਾਰੀ ਕਿਸੇ ਨੂੰ 10000 ਹਜ਼ਾਰੀ ਜਿਸ ਦਿਨ ਜਿਸ ਟਾਈਮ ਮਹਾ ਸਿੰਘ ਜੀ ਨੂੰ ਗੋਦ ਵਿੱਚ ਲਿਆ ਤੇ ਉਹ ਸਹਿਕਦੇ ਸਨ ਤੇ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੇ ਕਿਹਾ ਮਹਾ ਸਿੰਘ ਜੀ ਤੁਸੀਂ ਸ਼ਹੀਦ ਹੋਏ ਹੋ ਇਸ ਕੌਮ ਦੀ ਖਾਤਰ ਇਸ ਦੀ ਲੱਜਾ ਦੀ ਖਾਤਰ ਮੰਗੋ ਕੀ ਮੰਗਣਾ ਹੈ ਤੇ ਤੁਸੀਂ ਹੈਰਾਨ ਹੋ ਗਏ ਇਤਿਹਾਸ ਗਵਾਹ ਹੈ ਲਿਖਤ ਹੈ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੇ ਕਿਹਾ ਗੁਰੂ ਸਾਹਿਬ ਅਸੀਂ ਇਹ ਮੰਗਦੇ ਹਾਂ ਕਿ ਸਾਡਾ ਉਹ ਵਿਦਾਵਾ ਪਾੜ ਦਿਓ ਗੁਰੂ ਸਾਹਿਬ ਨੇ ਆਪਣੇ ਕਮਰ ਕਸੇ ਵਿੱਚੋਂ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਸੰਭਾਲਿਆ ਹੋਇਆ ਸੀ ਉਹ ਕੱਢ ਕੇ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਦੇ ਸਾਹਮਣੇ ਫਾੜ ਦਿੱਤਾ ਤੇ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਕਿਹਾ ਗਿਆ ਕਿ ਮਹਾ ਸਿੰਘ ਤੁਸੀਂ ਹਮੇਸ਼ਾ ਹੀ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਹੈ ਜਿੰਦਾ ਰਹੋਗੇ ਤੁਹਾਡਾ ਹਮੇਸ਼ਾ ਨਾਮ ਲਿਆ ਜਾਏਗਾ ਇਹ ਹੈ ਮੋਟੀਵੇਸ਼ਨ ਇਹ ਹੈ ਸਾਡੇ ਸਾਹਮਣੇ ਇਤਿਹਾਸ ਦੀਆਂ ਤਵਾਰੀਖ ਦੀਆਂ ਅਸਲੀਅਤਾਂ ਅਗਰ ਸਾਡੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਉਹ ਹੋਸ਼ ਉਹ ਜੋਸ਼ ਉਹ ਸਾਡੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਜਜ਼ਬਾ ਪੈਦਾ ਹੋ ਜਾਵੇ ਤਾਂ ਕੀ ਕਾਰਨ ਹੈ ਕਿ ਬੱਚੀਆਂ ਨੂੰ ਕੁੱਖ ਵਿੱਚ ਮਾਰਿਆ ਜਾਂਦਾ ਕਾਨੂੰਨ ਤਾਂ ਕਹਿੰਦਾ ਕਿ ਬੱਚੀ ਨੂੰ ਕੁੱਖ ਵਿੱਚ ਵੀ ਆਪਣਾ ਅਧਿਕਾਰ ਹੈ ਸੋ ਮੇਰਾ ਅੱਜ ਇਹ ਕਹਿਣਾ ਹੈ ਕਿ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਲੜਕੀ ਹੈ ਉਹ ਇੱਕ ਐਸਟ ਐਸਟ ਹੈ ਉਹ ਸਮਾਜ ਦੀ ਸਿਰਜਣਹਾਰੀ ਹੈ ਉਸ ਨੂੰ ਤੁਸੀਂ ਬਾਈ ਆਲ ਮੀਨਸ ਉਸ ਨੂੰ ਇੱਕ ਬੋਝ ਨਹੀਂ ਕਹਿ ਸਕਦੇ ਰਾਦ ਉਹ ਇੱਕ ਐਸਟ ਹੈ ਉਸ ਨੂੰ ਤੁਸੀਂ ਅਗਰ ਉਸ ਕੁਦਰਤ ਦੀ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਬਲੈਸਿੰਗ ਹੈਗੀ ਹੈ ਅਗਰ ਉਸ ਦਾ ਸਤਕਾਰ ਕਰਦੇ ਹੋ ਉਸ ਨੂੰ ਬਣਦੇ ਹੱਕ ਦਵਾਉਂਦੇ ਹੋ ਤਾਂ ਨਿਰਸੰਦੇਹ ਸਮਾਜ ਵਿੱਚ ਤਬਦੀਲੀ ਆਉਣੀ ਬੜੀ ਸੁਭਾਵਿਕ ਹੈ ਲੇਕਿਨ ਸਾਨੂੰ ਇਹ ਦਿਨ ਮਨਾ ਕੇ ਵੀ ਯਾਦ ਕਰਨਾ ਇੱਕ ਬਹੁਤ ਅੱਛੀ ਗੱਲ ਹੈ ਤਾਂ ਕਿ ਅਸੀਂ ਲੜਕੀਆਂ ਦੇ ਪੋਜੀਸ਼ਨ ਨੂੰ ਸੋਸਾਇਟੀ ਵਿੱਚ ਪ੍ਰਮੋਟ ਕਰ ਸਕੀਏ ਅਤੇ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਦੀ ਲਿਵਿੰਗ ਨੂੰ ਸੋਸਾਇਟੀ ਵਿੱਚ ਵਰਤ ਕਰਾ ਸਕੀਏ ਸਾਨੂੰ ਡਿਸਕ੍ਰਿਮੀਨੇਸ਼ਨ ਵੱਲ ਖਾਸ ਧਿਆਨ ਦੇਣਾ ਚਾਹੀਦਾ ਹੈ ਇਹ ਸਾਡੇ ਘਰਾਂ ਤੋਂ ਸ਼ੁਰੂ ਹੁੰਦਾ ਹੈ ਸੋਸਾਇਟੀ ਤੋਂ ਸ਼ੁਰੂ ਹੁੰਦਾ ਹੈ ਅਦਾਰਿਆਂ ਵਿੱਚ ਸਾਨੂੰ ਇਸ ਚੀਜ਼ ਦਾ ਸੈਂਸਿਟਾਈਜੇਸ਼ਨ ਕਰਨਾ ਚਾਹੀਦਾ ਹੈ ਸੋ ਇਹ ਜਗਤ ਬਾਬਾ ਗੁਰੂ ਨਾਨਕ ਦੇਵ ਜੀ ਦੇ ਨਾਮ ਨਾਲ ਬਰਿਆ ਹੋਇਆ ਵਿਸ਼ਵ ਵਿਦਿਆਲਿਆ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਦੀ ਜਿੱਥੇ ਇੱਕ ਬਹੁਤ ਵੱਡੀ ਜ਼ਿੰਮੇਵਾਰੀ ਵੀ ਬਣਦੀ ਹੈ ਉੱਥੇ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਇਹ ਚੀਜ਼ ਦਾ ਮਾਣ ਵੀ ਪ੍ਰਾਪਤ ਹੈ ਕਿ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਉਸ ਜਗਤ ਬਾਬਾ ਗੁਰੂ ਨਾਨਕ ਦੇਵ ਜੀ ਦੇ ਨਾਮ ਨਾਲ ਪੁਕਾਰਿਆ ਜਾਂਦਾ ਹੈ ਉਹ ਨਵਨ ਕਲੇਚਰ ਤੁਹਾਨੂੰ ਦਿੱਤਾ ਗਿਆ ਹੈ ਦੇਖੋ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਹੈਗਾ 33% ਰੈਜ਼ਰਵੇਸ਼ਨ ਕੀਤੀ ਗਈ ਮੈਂ ਉਹ ਵਿੱਚੋਂ ਮਿਸ ਕਰ ਗਈ ਸੀ ਅਮੈਂਡਮੈਂਟ 73 74 ਮੈਂ ਉਹਦੇ ਉੱਪਰ ਰਿਸਰਚ ਵੀ ਕੀਤੀ ਸੀਗੀ ਕਿ 33% ਔਰਤਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਲੋਕਲ ਸੈਲਫ ਗਵਰਨਮੈਂਟ ਵਿੱਚ ਭਾਗੇਦਾਰੀ ਮਿਲੇਗੀ ਮੇਰੇ ਸਾਹਮਣੇ ਬੜੇ ਹੀ ਹੈਰਾਨ ਕਰਨ ਵਾਲੇ ਤੱਤ ਸਾਹਮਣੇ ਆਏ ਕਿ ਜਿਹੜੀਆਂ ਲੇਡੀਜ਼ ਜਿਹੜੀਆਂ ਔਰਤਾਂ ਇਲੈਕਟ ਹ
ਉਹਦੀ ਇੰਪਰੂਵਮੈਂਟ ਵਾਸਤੇ ਅੱਜ ਸੋਚੀਏ ਡਿਵੈਲਪਮੈਂਟ ਵਾਸਤੇ ਸੋਚੀਏ ਮੈਂ ਇੱਥੇ ਜੁਵੀਨਲ ਜਸਟਿਸ ਐਕਟ ਦਾ ਮੇਰੇ ਸਹਿਯੋਗੀ ਨੇ ਨੀਰਾ ਵਰਮਾ ਜੀ ਨੇ ਇਸ ਚੀਜ਼ ਦੀ ਖੁਸ਼ੀ ਜ਼ਾਹਰ ਕੀਤੀ ਸੀਗੀ ਸੋ ਮੈਂ ਇਹ ਕਹਿਣੀ ਆ ਕਿ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਜੁਵੀਨਲ ਜਸਟਿਸ ਐਕਟ ਹੈ ਉਹ ਵੀ ਬੱਚਿਆਂ ਵਾਸਤੇ ਖਾਸ ਕਰਕੇ ਬਣਾਇਆ ਗਿਆ ਫਾਰ ਬੋਥ ਸੈਕਸਸ ਉਹਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਮੈਂਡੇਟਰੀ ਕੀਤਾ ਗਿਆ ਮੈਂਡੇਟ ਕੀਤਾ ਗਿਆ ਕਿ ਚਾਈਲਡ ਵੈਲਫੇਅਰ ਕਮੇਟੀ ਐਂਡ ਜੁਵੀਨਾਈਲ ਜਸਟਿਸ ਬੋਰਡ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਆ ਸਟੈਟੂਟਰੀ ਬੋਡੀਜ਼ ਕੰਸਟੀਟਿਊਟ ਕੀਤੀਆਂ ਜਾਣਗੀਆਂ ਸਟੇਟ ਲੈਵਲ ਤੇ ਤਾਂ ਕਿ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਚਾਈਲਡ ਵੈਲਫੇਅਰ ਕਮੇਟੀ ਹੈ ਉਹ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਬੱਚੇ ਆਰਫਨ ਨੇ ਅਬੰਡਨ ਨੇ ਸੁਰੈਂਡਰ ਨੇ ਸਟ੍ਰੀਟ ਚਿਲਡਰਨ ਨੇ ਔਰ ਲੇਬਰ ਕਰਦੇ ਨੇ ਜਾਂ ਬੈਗਰੀ ਵਿੱਚ ਬੱਚਿਆਂ ਦਾ ਸੋਸ਼ਣ ਹੋ ਰਿਹਾ ਹੈ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਦੀ ਵੈਲਫੇਅਰ ਵਾਸਤੇ ਸੋਚਿਆ ਜਾਏ ਸੋ ਉਹਦੇ ਵਾਸਤੇ ਕਾਫੀ ਚੰਡੀਗੜ੍ਹ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਮੈਂ ਕਹਿ ਸਕਦੀ ਹਾਂ ਕਾਫੀ ਅੱਛਾ ਕੰਮ ਹੋ ਰਿਹਾ ਹੈ ਸਟੇਟਸ ਵੀ ਕਾਫੀ ਹੁਣ ਸੰਜੀਦਾ ਹੋਈਆਂ ਨੇ ਇਸੇ ਤਰ੍ਹਾਂ ਪ੍ਰੈਜ਼ੈਂਟਲੀ ਵੇਅਰ ਆਈ ਐਮ ਵਰਕਿੰਗ ਇਜ਼ ਜੁਵੀਨਲ ਜਸਟਿਸ ਬੋਰਡ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਬੱਚੇ ਕਨਫਲਿਕਟ ਵਿਦ ਲਾ 18 ਸਾਲ ਦੀ ਉਮਰ ਤੋਂ ਨੀਚੇ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਕ੍ਰਾਈਮ ਦੀ ਦੁਨੀਆ ਵਿੱਚ ਆ ਜਾਂਦੇ ਨੇ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਹੈਂਡਲ ਕਰਨ ਦਾ ਮੈਨੂੰ ਸੁਭਾਗ ਪ੍ਰਾਪਤ ਹੋਇਆ ਮੈਂ ਦੇਖਦੀ ਹਾਂ ਕਿ ਕਿਸ ਤਰ੍ਹਾਂ ਅਨਪੋਲ ਵਿੱਚ ਬੱਚੇ ਇਨੋਸੈਂਸ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਦੀ ਉਮਰ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਹੈਗੀ ਹੈ ਉਹਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਕਿਸੇ ਦੇ ਪੀਅਰ ਗਰੁੱਪ ਚ ਆ ਕੇ ਜਾਂ ਐਕਸਪਲੋਇਟ ਕਰਕੇ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਯੂਜ਼ ਕੀਤਾ ਜਾਂਦਾ ਹੈ ਚਾਹੇ ਕ੍ਰਾਈਮ ਕਰਨ ਦੇ ਵਾਸਤੇ ਚਾਹੇ ਡਰੱਗਸ ਅਬਿਊਜ਼ ਦੇ ਵਾਸਤੇ ਸੋ ਬੜਾ ਹੀ ਸੈਂਸਿਟਿਵ ਇਸ਼ੂ ਹੈਗਾ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਬੱਚਿਆਂ ਨੂੰ ਬਹੁਤ ਹੀ ਧਿਆਨ ਦੇਣ ਦੇਣ ਤੋਂ ਬਾਅਦ ਕਾਉਂਸਲਿੰਗ ਕਰਨ ਤੋਂ ਬਾਅਦ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨਾਲ ਰੈਗੂਲਰਲੀ ਇੰਟਰੈਕਸ਼ਨ ਕਰਨ ਤੋਂ ਬਾਅਦ ਇਹ ਚੀਜ਼ ਸਾਡੇ ਸਾਹਮਣੇ ਆਉਂਦੀ ਹੈ ਤਕਰੀਬਨ ਹਰ ਰੋਜ਼ ਕਿ ਬੱਚੇ ਸੱਚਮੁੱਚ ਹੀ ਅੱਛਾ ਬਣਨਾ ਚਾਹੁੰਦੇ ਨੇ ਬੱਚਿਆਂ ਦੇ ਮਾਪੇ ਕੋਈ ਨਹੀਂ ਚਾਹੁੰਦੇ ਅਸੀਂ ਆਪਾਂ ਖੁਦ ਪੇਰੈਂਟਸ ਹੈਗੇ ਆ ਕੋਈ ਪੇਰੈਂਟ ਇਹ ਨਹੀਂ ਚਾਹੁੰਦਾ ਕਿ ਮੇਰਾ ਬੱਚਾ ਆਫ ਦੀ ਟ੍ਰੈਕ ਚਲਾ ਜਾਏ ਬੱਚੇ ਲੇਕਿਨ ਇਹ ਹੈ ਕਿ ਇੱਕ ਕ੍ਰਾਈਮ ਦੀ ਦੁਨੀਆ ਵਿੱਚ ਕੌਣ ਜਾਂਦਾ ਹੈ ਜਿਨ੍ਹਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਲਵ ਐਂਡ ਅਫੈਕਸ਼ਨ ਤੋਂ ਡਿਪਰਾਈਵ ਬੱਚੇ ਹੈਗੇ ਨੇ ਸਟ੍ਰੀਟ ਚਿਲਡਰਨ ਹੈਗੇ ਨੇ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਪੈਦਾ ਵੀ ਸਟ੍ਰੀਟ ਤੇ ਹੁੰਦੇ ਨੇ ਸੜਕ ਤੇ ਹੁੰਦੇ ਨੇ ਤੇ ਜ਼ਿੰਦਗੀ ਵੀ ਉੱਥੇ ਗੁਜ਼ਾਰਦੇ ਨੇ ਸੋ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਅਗਰ ਧਿਆਨ ਦਿੱਤਾ ਜਾਵੇ ਦੇ ਕੈਨ ਬੀ ਬੈਟਰ ਯੂ نو ਚਿਲਡਰਨ ਐਕਟ ਕਹਿੰਦਾ ਹੈ ਕਿ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਰੀਹੈਬਿਲਿਟੇਟ ਕੀਤਾ ਜਾਏ ਮੇਨ ਸਟ੍ਰੀਮ ਆਫ ਦਾ ਸੋਸਾਇਟੀ ਚ ਲੈ ਕੇ ਆਂਦਾ ਜਾਏ ਸੋ ਇਹਦਾ ਜ਼ਿਕਰ ਮੈਂ ਇਸ ਕਰਕੇ ਕੀਤਾ ਕਿ ਸਾਰੀਆਂ ਹੀ ਤਰ੍ਹਾਂ ਸੁਹਿਰਦ ਤਰ੍ਹਾਂ ਜਿਹੜੀਆਂ ਨੇ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਇਸ ਪਾਸੇ ਵੀ ਧਿਆਨ ਦੇਣਾ ਚਾਹੀਦਾ ਹੈ ਕਿ ਅਗਰ ਤੁਹਾਡੇ ਪਾਸ ਕੋਈ ਬੱਚਾ ਘਰਾਂ ਵਿੱਚ ਛੋਟੀ ਉਮਰ ਦਾ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਕਿ ਪ੍ਰਹਿਪਟਰ ਹੈਗਾ ਲਾਅ ਵੱਲੋਂ ਜਾਂ ਕੈਂਟੀਨਾ ਵਿੱਚ ਕਈ ਵਾਰੀ ਯੂਨੀਵਰਸਿਟੀ ਦੀਆਂ ਜਾਂ ਹੋਰ ਕੰਮ ਕਰਦੇ ਮਿਲੋ ਤਾਂ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਦੇ ਟੈਲੀਫੋਨ ਨੰਬਰ ਤੁਹਾਡੇ ਅੱਜ ਕੱਲ ਤਾਂ ਇੰਟਰਨੈਟ ਦਾ ਜ਼ਮਾਨਾ ਹੈਗਾ ਸਭ ਮਿਲ ਜਾਂਦੇ ਨੇ ਰਿਸਪੈਕਟਿਵ ਚਾਈਲਡ ਵੈਲਫੇਅਰ ਕਮੇਟੀ ਨੂੰ ਇਮੀਡੀਏਟਲੀ ਨੋਟਿਸ ਕਰੋ ਚਾਈਲਡ ਹੈਲਪਲਾਈਨ ਨੂੰ ਸੂਚਿਤ ਕਰੋ ਤਾਂ ਕਿ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਬੱਚਿਆਂ ਦਾ ਟੇਕ ਕੇਅਰ ਕੀਤਾ ਜਾਵੇ ਸਟੇਟ ਦੀ ਰਿਸਪੌਂਸਿਬਿਲਟੀ ਹੈ ਕਿ ਬੱਚੇ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਹੈਗੇ ਨੇ ਉਹ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਦੀ ਜ਼ਿੰਮੇਵਾਰੀ ਹੈ ਜਿਨ੍ਹਾਂ ਦੇ ਪੇਰੈਂਟਸ ਟੇਕ ਕੇਅਰ ਨਹੀਂ ਕਰ ਸਕਦੇ ਜਿਨ੍ਹਾਂ ਦੇ ਕੋਈ ਅੱਗੇ ਪਿੱਛੇ ਨਹੀਂ ਹੈਗਾ ਜਾਂ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਆਰਫਰ ਦੇ ਬੱਚੇ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਦਾ ਧਿਆਨ ਕਰਨਾ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਦਾ ਹਰ ਤਰ੍ਹ
ਮਹੱਤਵਪੂਰਨ ਜਗ੍ਹਾ ਦਿੱਤੀ ਹੈ ਮਾਤਾ ਧਰਤ ਮਹਤ ਕਿਆ ਹੈ ਨਾਰੀ ਪੁਰਖ ਪੁਰਖ ਸਭ ਨਾਰੀ ਸਭ ਏਕੋ ਪੁਰਖ ਮਰਾਰੇ ਸਭ ਇੱਕ ਦੀ ਹੀ ਔਲਾਦ ਹਨ ਗੁਰੂ ਸਾਹਿਬ ਨੇ ਸਾਨੂੰ ਸ਼ਬਦ ਗੁਰੂ ਦੁਆਰਾ ਅਮਰਤ ਬਾਣੀ ਦਿੱਤੀ ਹੈ ਜਿਸ ਦੁਆਰਾ ਕਿ ਅਸੀਂ ਆਪਣੇ ਜੀਵਨ ਨੂੰ ਸਵਾਰ ਸਕਦੇ ਹਾਂ ਮਾਨਸ ਦੇ ਦੁਲੰਭ ਹੈ ਇਸ ਕਰਕੇ ਇੱਕ ਮਾਨਵ ਹੋਣ ਦੇ ਨਾਤੇ ਇੱਕ ਸੂਝਵਾਨ ਵਿਅਕਤੀ ਹੋਣ ਦੇ ਨਾਤੇ ਗੁਰੂ ਦੇ ਆਸ਼ੇ ਨੂੰ ਅਗਰ ਅਸੀਂ ਅਪਣਾ ਲੈਨੇ ਹਾਂ ਅਗਰ ਅਸੀਂ ਆਪਣਾ ਫਰਜ਼ ਨਿਭਾ ਲੈਨੇ ਹਾਂ ਲੈਟਸ ਕਮ ਟੂਗੇਦਰ ਲੈਟਸ ਪਲੇਸ ਟੂਗੇਦਰ ਔਨ ਥਿਸ ਡੇ ਥੈਟ ਵੀ ਆਲ ਆਲ ਵਿਲ ਪਰਫਾਰਮ ਆਵਰ ਡਿਊਟੀ ਹੋਲ ਹਾਰਟਡਲੀ ਲੜਕੀ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਹੈ ਗਰਲ ਚਾਈਲਡ ਹੈ ਉਹ ਐਸੈਟ ਹੈ ਉਹ ਹੋਲ ਹੈ ਕਹਿੰਦੇ ਨੇ ਸਨ ਇਜ਼ ਏ ਸਨ ਟਿਲ ਹੀ ਗੈਟਸ ਹਿਸ ਵਾਈਫ ਡਾਟਰ ਇਜ਼ ਦ ਡਾਟਰ ਥਰੂ ਆਊਟ ਆਫ ਹਰ ਲਾਈਫ ਸੋ ਇਸ ਤਰ੍ਹਾਂ ਬੱਚੀ ਨੂੰ ਬਹੁਤ ਹੀ ਮਹੱਤਵਪੂਰਨ ਸਥਾਨ ਮਿਲਣਾ ਚਾਹੀਦਾ ਹੈ ਮੇਰੇ ਦੋ ਪੁਆਇੰਟ ਬਣ ਚਾਹੁੰਦੇ ਨੇ ਕਿ ਕਿਉਂ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਸੈਕਸ ਡਿਟਰਮੀਨੇਸ਼ਨ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਹੈਗਾ ਉਹ ਬੈਨ ਹੋਣ ਦੇ ਬਾਵਜੂਦ ਵੀ ਇੱਕ ਚੱਲ ਰਿਹਾ ਹੈਗਾ ਤੇ ਕਿਸੇ ਨੂੰ ਪੁੱਛਿਆ ਜਾਵੇ ਤਾਂ ਉਹ ਕਹਿੰਦੇ ਨੇ ਸੇਫਟੀ ਸਿਕਿਉਰਿਟੀ ਨਹੀਂ ਹੈ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਲਾ ਐਂਡ ਆਰਡਰ ਦੀ ਸਿਚੁਏਸ਼ਨ ਖਰਾਬ ਹੈ ਕਿ ਮਾਂ-ਬਾਪ ਸੋਚਦੇ ਨੇ ਪੜਨ ਭੇਜਿਆ ਤਾਂ ਵੀ ਸਾਨੂੰ ਫਿਕਰ ਹੈ ਨਾ ਭੇਜਿਆ ਤਾਂ ਵੀ ਕੁਝ ਨਹੀਂ ਬਣਦਾ ਦੂਸਰਾ ਹੈ ਡਿਸਪਾਈਟ ਡੋਰੀ ਪ੍ਰੋਹਿਬਿਸ਼ਨ ਐਕਟ ਇਟਸ ਬੈਂਡ ਬਾਈ ਬਾਈ ਐਨ ਐਕਟ ਇਹ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਹੈਗਾ ਮਾਪਿਆਂ ਨੂੰ ਇੱਕ ਧੀਰੇ ਮਾਪੇ ਹੋਣ ਦੇ ਨਾਤੇ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਬੜਾ ਹੀ ਸਾਹਮਣਾ ਕਰਨਾ ਪੈ ਰਿਹਾ ਹੈ ਅੱਜ ਦੇ ਇਸ ਦਿਨ ਮੇਰਾ ਤੁਹਾਨੂੰ ਸਾਰਿਆਂ ਨੂੰ ਗੁਜ਼ਾਰਿਸ਼ ਹੈ ਕਿ ਦਿਨ ਮਨਾਉਣ ਦੇ ਨਾਲ ਨਾਲ ਅਸੀਂ ਇਹ ਵੀ ਅਵੇਅਰਨੈਸ ਜਨਰੇਟ ਕਰੀਏ ਪਲੈਜ ਲਈਏ ਕਿ ਅਸੀਂ ਬੱਚੀਆਂ ਨੂੰ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਹੈਗਾ ਡੌਰੀ ਨਹੀਂ ਲੈਣੀ ਜਾਂ ਸੇਫਟੀ ਸਿਕਿਉਰਿਟੀ ਵਿੱਚ ਦੇਖੋ ਉਸ ਬਾਬੇ ਨਾਨਕ ਦੀ ਧਰਤੀ ਤੇ ਰੇਪ ਘਰਾਂ ਵਿੱਚ ਹੀ ਹੋ ਰਹੇ ਨੇ ਸੋ ਕਿੰਨੀ ਦੁੱਖ ਦੀ ਗੱਲ ਹੈ ਸ਼ਰਮ ਦੀ ਗੱਲ ਹੈ ਸਿਰ ਚੁੱਕ ਜਾਂਦਾ ਹੈ ਸ਼ਰਮ ਦੇ ਨਾਲ ਸੋ ਉਸ ਐਸੈਟ ਨੂੰ ਸੰਭਾਲੀਏ ਸਮਾਜ ਦਾ ਉਹ ਐਸੈਟ ਹੈ ਜਿਹਦੇ ਬਿਨਾ ਸੰਸਾਰ ਚੱਲ ਨਹੀਂ ਸਕਦਾ ਕੇਵਲ ਔਰਤ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਹੈ ਆਪਾਂ ਕਹਿ ਦਿੰਨੇ ਔਰਤ ਹੀ ਔਰਤ ਦੀ ਦੁਸ਼ਮਣ ਹੈ ਇਹ ਗੱਲ ਦਰਅਸਲ ਨਹੀਂ ਹੈ ਇਹ ਸਾਨੂੰ ਹੈਮਰ ਕੀਤੀ ਗਈ ਹੈ देयर इज नो डिफरेंस आई एम नॉट क्रिएटिंग यू नो डिवीजन बिटवीन मेन एंड वुमेन एक दूसरे दे जेड़े सहारे जिंदगी दी गड्डी चलती है सो so, मेरा ख्याल है मैं डॉक्टर अनीता जी मैं समय तो ज्यादा शायद नहीं गई होवांगी सो so, अगर मैं 2 4 मिनट ले ले तब मैं थानू कहनी है कि मेनू तुसी माफी दियोगे सो so, बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद वाइस चांसलर साहब ते ओना दी काबल टीम दा जिन्ना ने मेनू ਇਸ ਮੰਚ ਤੋਂ ਸਮਾਂ ਦਿੱਤਾ ਮੈਂ ਵੀ ਆਪਣੇ ਹਿਰਦੇ ਦੀਆਂ ਡੂੰਘਾਈਆਂ ਤੋਂ ਕੋਸ਼ਿਸ਼ ਕੀਤੀ ਹੈ ਆਪਣੇ ਵਿਚਾਰ ਆਪਣੀ ਮਾਤ ਭਾਸ਼ਾ ਵਿੱਚ ਸਾਂਝੇ ਕਰਨ ਦੀ ਤਾਂ ਕਿ ਵਾਈਡ ਸਪਰੈਡ ਮੈਸੇਜ ਮੈਂ ਦੇ ਸਕਾਂ ਇਹ ਮੇਰਾ ਫਰਜ਼ ਵੀ ਹੈ ਡਿਊਟੀ ਵੀ ਹੈ ਫੰਡਾਮੈਂਟਲ ਰਾਈਟਸ ਨਾਲ ਰਾਈਟਸ ਨਹੀਂ ਮਿਲਦੇ ਜਦ ਤੱਕ ਤੁਸੀਂ ਡਿਊਟੀਜ਼ ਆਪਣੀਆਂ ਪਰਫਾਰਮ ਨਹੀਂ ਕਰਦੇ ਆਪਣੀ ਫਰਜ਼ ਨਿਭਾਓ ਤੇ ਅਧਿਕਾਰ ਆਪਣੇ ਆਪ ਹੋ ਜਾਂਦੇ ਨੇ ਬਹੁਤ ਬਹੁਤ ਧੰਨਵਾਦ ਤੁਹਾਨੂੰ ਇੱਕ ਵਾਰ ਫਿਰ ਬਹੁਤ ਬਹੁਤ ਮੁਬਾਰਕ ਹੈਪੀ ਗਰਲ ਚਾਈਲਡ ਡੇ ਟੂ ਆਲ ਥੈਂਕ ਯੂ ਥੈਂਕ ਯੂ ਸੋ ਮਚ ਮੈਮ ਡਾਕਟਰ ਮਦਨਜੀਤ ਕੌਰ ਸਹੋਤਾ ਥਰੋਸ ਲਾਈਟ ਔਨ ਦੀ ਪੋਜੀਸ਼ਨ ਆਫ ਵੂਮੈਨ ਵਿਦ ਸਪੈਸ਼ਲ ਰੈਫਰੈਂਸ ਵਿਦ ਸਪੈਸ਼ਲ ਰੈਫਰੈਂਸ ਫਰਮ ਸਿਕ ਹਿਸਟਰੀ ਸ਼ੀ ਫੋਕਸਡ ਔਨ ਦ ਰਾਈਟਸ ਐਂਡ ਡਿਗਨਿਟੀ ਆਫ ਦ ਚਿਲਡਰਨ ਸ਼ੁੱਡ ਬੀ ਇੰਟੈਕਟ and every child should get
of celebrating today national girls child day and then on the selection of learner speakers and i'm very happy that when dr neeta gill she came to with me with the proposal that the type of resource person she has been thinking of i merely said that it's a, it's a, it will be a great event and whatever i thought at that time that after listening to all the three learner speaker i must say that section is really is, is a great professor mary john she is a great researcher and it's always a treat to i mean listen to her research work she started with historical background talking about the 19th century social reforms coming to the research orientation orientation or uh, i mean that uh, thinking finding of european country that girls are having a slightly better chance of survival but something is different in india then she talked about uh, you know that uh, a very very interesting fact about particularly about punjab because i belong to punjab and i i understand that yes rightly or wrongly there was a some preference earlier towards a male child admittedly admittedly that it's a it's a social norm in punjab particular rana also you can say that if the first child is i mean baby is born if it happens to be a boy child then no issue but if first child is a girl child then yes the thinking is there so she brought out a very very historical fact about that when professor neera verma you know she spoke she was a, she is a rather economist by profession and you know your profession you know it 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 reflects from your conversation also she rightly pointed out that employability or for that matter economic independence is something very very important she built up a case and this, that's a beautifully she has narrated that that is the only way out by which we can find a solution professor madanjit dr marjit sota ji she is like my elder sister i i you know that uh, i admire her not because of her in depth knowledge of uh, uh, gurbani or living but her her conduct and her uh, you know practical life also exhibits that she believes in what our gurus uh, i mean dictated us and try to live her life accordingly and when she was a principal different forum i could see even in university uh, uh, senate member also she contributed a lot so i am really really grateful to all the uh, all the learned speakers because they have enriched us they have enriched us with with not only the information with not only, only the facts but they also guided us in society now when i see i mean that uh, i am a management student my perspective is that uh, planning is one thing thinking is one thing but its execution how to implement that how to stem the rot we understand that there is a issue there is a problem problem dr gurleen when she started that she talked about the i uh, mean uh, uh, that that aj akha varsha wali gal ne shuru kiti si she started with that ik roi si ti punjab di varsha nu kya tu likh likh mare ve no we we are aware we are aware there is a problem but what should be done so just taking a leave i'm just repeating because already uh, speakers have come out with solution also i i i strongly feel that there in india particularly there is a issue is there but issue is resolving i will talk something on other aspect also to my mind there are three specific solution which can be taken into account as far as women empowerment is concerned because when 2008 when this national girl child day was celebrated every year there is a theme in particular there was a theme is there even last year there was a theme every year themes are changing 
this time this team is more the empowerment i believe that uh, uh, in 2020 21 last year the theme was digital i mean generation we are talking about the digital uh, empowerment uh, we were talking that time i am just the giving my first solution not my first solution but the the point which is echoed by professor neera verma also that nowadays it's a, it's a time of digital wave or you can say digital uh, we want a uh, sort of thing now first solution is that education is important but education with employability that is something very very important so i do agree with this with the, with the viewpoint of professor neera verma and probably all our speaker also agree that if women is if you really want to empower the women we need to make them economically independent it's not a question of independent it's question of it's a question of that mindset should be there that if education is there education for what now here i am saying that open university is playing a vital role it's not a question of women it's a question of, of not of girl but boys also what is the use of you know when baba nanak talked about kirt karo he was emphasizing on three things he was emphasizing that there should be a skill orientation is there that we should either be i mean that i uh, able to generate employment entrepreneur or we should be capable of serving the society also so what i believe is that education has no meaning that is why my i and my team when we started our open university we are very particular we are not starting any course right which is not linked with the employability even we have signed an mou with the industry also and we are making it compulsory for all the students to to start some certificate courses which can equip them with some employability even uh, for instance for bcom students we are having that a basic thing about income tax if income tax return can be filed by a student even a girl or a boy sitting at his place at her his or her place they can uh, uh, earn the money also we are talking about a gst uh, return uh, so many so many people are dependent upon the what i mean to say that we want that in our open university that every student should be imparted with some sort of skill so that they can at least even if they are not getting employment but they can generate employment accordingly this is our motto also so this is the first solution which i believe in second thing which i believe is that uh, you see women empowerment when i you talk about women empowerment don't take me otherwise i believe i have a strong conviction that it is more linked with human rights this is our scripture told us human rights when we are talking about it means that it's it's a right it's right of a male or female it's not a question of male or female it's a question of that everybody should be economically independent i do believe that there was issues about the i mean sociological issues are there cultural issues are there psychological issues are there all issues are there but when i talking i am talking about human rights i mean that what i i believe it strongly that human rights should be preserved because what happened i am touching a very very i mean some sensitive part of that you see empowerment is one thing but in the garb of empowerment sometimes sometimes we cross the line also i could see in the urban area you see i am not said that modesty is the is the trait or good thing for the girls it is for the boys also it's both way respecting the human rights of each other this is important ingredients but in the garb of if you talk about in the garb of uh, uh, this empowerment if other thing is gone because i have seen because i i uh, prasamad ji sota will agree with me that there was when we talk about dori uh, cases also there was some misuse also when we talk about uh, i mean that culture where, where we are going it i happened to went to delhi i, I mean just yesterday i went uh, i mean last uh, i mean month i was in delhi 
and we are talking about the there is two type of delhi is there lutian delhi is there the type of culture which is evolving with the educated girl is is something not uh, uh, i mean believable i'm not saying that it's a boy or girl versus that once you take a that that thing that it's a boy versus girl i think that this need to be looked into properly important thing is that manas ki jaat sab ek ek pehchan bo it doesn't mean only for the casteism it's talk about the gender also everybody is equal because human rights when i talk about human rights so i think that we as an educationist we must propagate that there should be a proper balance between the male and female if we are we 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 do want that there should be some respect respect is required not only for girl but for boy also so i am not saying that other way around is there but i am saying that i am just bringing out a point this is second point ki human rights theory that should be developed third solution which i believe it should be that you see that uh, i that mother in sota will agree with me i have a little bit uh, uh, i mean gut feeling or strong conviction that if we really want to do away with any social sin right we have to take care of we have to i mean depend upon our spiritual guidance also you see guru amar das ji at that time when he spoke against sati pratha his quote was that satya en akhyan jo madhya lag jalan nanak satya janiye je bire chhod maran look at the concept gurbani gave an alternative also they have not you know they don't say we have take a leaf out of the living of guru sahab whenever guru sahab criticizes anything they criticize the concept of guru nanak criticizes the concept of jineu but he also provided with the alternative also so this is the not thing this is right thing when he demonstrated right ke puri ji jaake ke bhi i can send it to my to so what i what, what i i what what i believe that as an educationist unless and until i have a strong conviction that we start following our guru sahib we start following our scriptures we cannot resolve this social i mean malaise malaise or social things is there at the end i would like to say only thing that education employability one thing human rights second thing spiritual understanding another thing but add to that last thing which i would like to say that any improvement it starts from your own self you can't preach i can't preach that this should be done this should be done in public for because we are in a position we are educationists we can do we we can summon like anything but we should start for our self that what is our mindset i should see that women in my family are they feeling the same way are me considering i start from your family then i should start from the workplace my workplace you see that god is very kind to him kind to me particularly ki i happen to choose every faculty member of our uh, our university and incidentally we are having 13 uh, faculty members and out of that 13 faculty member the first person dean academy first was a woman and then seven women we have appointed and then around seven uh, i mean me chat is there it's it's a it's a matter of chance only not my contribution but when i introspect myself i would i would i would ensure i must see that my seven colleagues my seven sisters which are with me who are who are working with me are they are they feeling uh, good not only that seven what about the other six or seven boys which are working with me are they are also enjoying the same sort of companionship if my workplace is good if my family is good then i have a little bit right to say that there should be a woman i mean we, we can talk about this topic at the end i will not take much time because as a teacher i would go on speaking and speaking but 
but I could understand that time limit also. I once again express my gratitude to all the learned speaker. And I must say that due to Corona, we don't have much control. We have planned to physically have, I mean that we want to interact with the speakers also. And God willing, if I grew, permits us, we will again request Professor Mary, Professor Neera and Professor Madhajit Sohta Ji that they should visit our university. We will provide an opportunity also. And if the times comes, we would like to have a one-to-one -one interaction uh, with the, all of the learned speakers. And at the end, I once again congratulate my faculty, my Dean of Academic Affairs for all the efforts she has made. Thank you very much. Mubarak ji, baut, baut mubarak to Nusariyanu. Thank you, Hashika. Thank you so much, sir. Rightly said that we should create an environment in our society to, uh, as far as girl child is concerned. Uh, now I would like to call Professor G. S. Patra, Director Planning and Monitoring, to present vote of thanks. Professor G. S. Patra. Honorable Vice Chancellor Professor Premjit Singh, Dean Academic Affairs Professor Nita Gill, key speakers of today's webinar Professor Mary E. Johan, former Director, Center for Women Development Studies, Delhi, Professor Neera Verma, former Dean and Chairperson, Kurukshetra University, Kurukshetra, Dr. Madanjit Kaur Sahota, Member Juvenile Justice Board, Chandigarh, Registrar Dr. Taram Singh Sandhu, Shri Kuldeep Chang Gupta Ji, Controller of Examination, Dr. L.S. Bedi, Deputy Star, Dr. Sindar Pal Ji, my organizing colleagues, uh, Dr. Gurleen Aluwalia, Dr. Sukhpal Kaur, Dr. Pinky Sra, Ms. Param Preet Kaur, faculty and staff of the university, faculty and coordinators from Learning Sports Center, nodal officers of Sikhya Dad program, and dear students. First of all, I congratulate you all on the occasion of uh, National Girl Child Day being celebrated all over the country today. I welcome and thank you all on the occasion of the national webinar on Girl Child in India Issues and Concerns organized by Jagadguru Nanak Dev Punjab State Open University. I congratulate the organizing team under the leadership of Dean Academic Affairs Dr. Nita Gill for the initiative toward organizing this webinar on the occasion of Girl Child Day being celebrated in the country. The purpose of uh, this webinar is to create awareness about the policies and programs and the state of girl child in the country. The importance of celebrating National Girl Child Day in India has been very well explained by the, uh, by the Vice Chancellor, Dean Academic Affairs, and the worthy speakers through their scholarly lectures. It is not only essential for creating awareness, but also to provide equal opportunity to them in the fast changing world at large. First of all, I express my gratitude to Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor Karam Ji Singh Ji, for his uh, leadership to the university and motivation and support toward organizing this national webinar on a very important area on the occasion of National Girl Child Day. On behalf of Jagat Guru Nanak Dev Punjab State Open University, I express my gratitude to our key speakers, Professor Mary E. John, Professor Neera Verma, and Dr. Madanjit Kosota for their scholarly keynote address on this occasion. I thank each one of them for sparing their valuable time on this occasion. On behalf of uh, Jagat Guru Nanak Dev University, I thank uh, the nodal officers and other members uh, from outside the University Learner Sports Center, those who have joined on this occasion. I thank Dean Kajmin Kapir, Professor Nita Gill for her leadership role and her and uh, our organizing team comprising Professor Gulleen Alubalia, Dr. Sukhpal Kaur, Dr. Pinky Sra and Ms. Parampit Kaur and other faculty members for their initiative toward organizing this webinar on an important area. And this is an emerging and engaging area for study and research also at the same time. I thank our technical team, the public relations department, faculty and staff of the university for their support in organizing this webinar. At the end, I thank one and all. Jai Hind. Thank you all for your gracious presence. Thank you. 
थैंक यू थैंक यू एवरीबडी